introduce our first speaker. He is Daniel Gentofhotter from the University of the Pacific, speaking about low mass exoplanet demographics. Welcome, Daniel. Okay, thank you very much. Let me just begin my share here. Um, so firstly, I want to thank the entire organizing committee for this opportunity to review low mass exoplanet demographics. I'm going to highlight the progress over the last decade in the techniques that we have to characterize low mass planets, their biases, and the theoretical progress in turning planet masses and radii into inferred compositions. I'll then highlight the compositional diversity and show some of the subpopulations within the diverse world of low mass exoplanets. And finally, I'll look to the future and consider the prospects of characterizing systems beyond the compact configurations of transiting low mass planets and uh, to what extent atmospheric characterization will inform on bulk planet properties in the JWST era. Uh, firstly, stellar parameters. Six years ago, typical uncertainties in the stellar radius were 40% uh, in the Kepler input catalog, uh, with another peak around 10% from follow-up of high profile KOIs. Uh, propagating these uncertainties to planet radii leaves bulk densities hopelessly uncertain. However, with additional spectroscopy and precise distances from Gaia, the stellar radii uncertainties are now down to 3%, and this is no longer a bottleneck in characterizing planet compositions. Precise stellar parameters revealed a gap in exoplanet radii around 1.8 Earth radii. Ryan Kluche is going to give a review talk uh, later this morning on the radius valley. I am going to focus on the diversity of planets where radii and masses are measured enabling conclusions on bulk compositions. RV has made huge strides towards the terrestrial regime, approaching the noise floor due to stellar activity for low mass stars. This is a bigger problem for non-transiting planets since it is difficult to disentangle a weak planetary signal from stellar activity. For transiting planets, this can be mitigated since the orbital period and phase of the planet are known. On the right, we see that detections of order a meter per second are beginning to populate the RV characterizations over a wide range of orbital periods. While this has allowed Earth mass planets to be detectable at very short periods, a few days or less, solar system analogs are clearly still out of reach. Among the hosts, uh, G, K, and M are pushing the envelope towards the terrestrial regime. Most RV characterizations near a meter per second are at G dwarf stars. Uh, this presumably will change with relatively more low mass stars in the TESS input catalog compared to the Kepler input catalog. The TTVs of a transiting planet characterize the mass of the perturba, so both planets need to be transiting to measure masses and radii. The sensitivity of TTVs to near resonances, shown here with the sharp peaks on the left, is reflected in the planets that have been characterized. In addition, eccentricities increase TTV signals, causing a mass eccentricity degeneracy. Between resonant periods, um, you can get TTVs from synodic encounters. However, the non-resonant signal declines rapidly with increasing orbital period ratio. The majority of low mass planet characterizations are from TTV. This is not just because of the transit timing precision of Kepler. Uh, compact systems of sub-Neptunes are common and chains of multiple interacting transiting planets have rapidly populated the mass radius diagram for low mass planets, with seven interacting planets at TRAPPIST-1, five at Kepler-11, four at Kepler-79 and Kepler-80, three at Kepler-51, and so on. There are many other systems. The example here with Kepler-79 highlights how valuable these compact multis are. All four planets have TTV from near resonances. Kepler-79d, which has the best transit timing precision in the system, has TTV components due to synodic encounters that are detectable as well as the near resonances, making it an information-rich TTV signal. The TTVs of this one planet help break the degeneracy throughout the system, and we get four precisely measured masses. For the signal-to-noise ratio for TTV, uh, deeper transits enable more precisely measured transit times. So TTV is biased towards larger planets with lower densities than RV. TTV signals also improve with increasing orbital period in contrast to RV, although there are two different uh, regimes here. Several TTV systems have additional data from other space and ground-based observatories. Uh, despite the abundance of multi-planet systems, TTVs are actually exceedingly rare 
on the right, we show a histogram of expected signal to noise ratios for TTV given the orbital periods of planet pairs in the Kepler data and minimum expected mass given the radius and the transit timing uncertainty of the Kepler data. In all the mass characterizations that have been possible with Kepler data, we really are just probing a tiny fraction of the planets in Maltese, just the tail of this distribution. So any future mission that improves upon Kepler's baseline and precision will get a huge bump in the number of TTV systems. Here is the period radius scatter plot for Kepler with low mass planet characterizations from RV in purple and TTV in green with their different biases as a function of period, RV and TTV samples complement each other very nicely. TTVs have advanced planet characterization to planets smaller than Earth, uh, including Kepler 138b, uh, sub Venus planets at Kepler 444, and Kepler 345. So, with RV and TTV together, we have a very wide range of orbital periods and planet sizes with characterized low masses. Before I get into the characterized planets, I want to mention the theoretical mass radius relation uh, for a given composition. Uh, firstly, the state of metal in a planet's core is unknown. Uh, Earth's iron nickel core is half solid, half liquid, and at the boundary between them, the density changes by 5%. This may be less problematic for rocky super-Earths where you can assume the cores remain melted for a long time, but for planets smaller than Earth, there is a 1.5% uncertainty in the core radius if the state is unknown. Furthermore, there is a gap in the equation of state from 0.2 terapascals reached experimentally to the high pressure theoretical limit beyond 10 terapascals. This requires interpolation over almost two orders of magnitude and adds 2% uncertainty in the radius for a given mass for both metal and rock. Many models assume an earth-like mixture of metal and rock, and since this matches the sun and chondritic meteorites, However, even in the solar system, Mercury has an overabundance of iron, so the chondritic ratio is not right. For some systems, there is enough information to adopt the host stars iron magnesium ratio instead of the Earth's, and this changes the radius of the planet. On the right, we see here a wide range of possible core mantle ratios for Kepler 10b, even though it is a very well characterized exoplanet. The water content. in the water content of a volatile rich planet is crucial to understanding where it formed. In a purely water world, uh, there is some uncertainty in planet radius given the unknown state of water uh, and whether or not thermal effects are included. Hence the huge differences here between different studies. More recent experimental data has reduced the theoretical uncertainty on an ice planet radius for a given mass to around one to 2% with a caveat that this is in the absence of thermal effects. Accounting for thermal effects is model dependent. In this example by Zhang et al, uh, they assume that the water PT profile follows the fluid solid boundary over a wide range of pressures. For a planet smaller than a purely water world, a water ice composition is possible but not necessary. But anything above these blue curves uh, must have a deep atmosphere. Estimating the mass of such an envelope is not trivial since a detailed cooling model for the planet is required, including integrating the mass loss rate as the high energy flux declines over time. The planet radius is a function of its composition, the flux from the star and age, um, which all add theoretical uncertainty. However, between these three factors, uh, the radius is most sensitive to the hydrogen helium content. So to a certain extent, radius can be a proxy for composition. All right, let's put up the characterized planets. The first thing you notice is the separation between the RV planets and the TTV planets. Now, these are consistent with the biases that I mentioned earlier. Most importantly, we see a wide range in density among low mass exoplanets with planets around four Earth masses ranging from super Earth size to Saturn size. Given that we usually only observe planet radii in transit surveys, this leads to an impossibly degenerate mass for a Saturn size companion. It could be anything from a four Earth mass planet to a brown dwarf or even a low mass star. It's not quite as bad as that, and I will return to the extreme low density planets later. For now, let's acknowledge that there is no one-to-one -one mass radius relation, but rather a probabilistic relation that accounts for the scatter seen in masses and radii, first modeled by Wolfgang et al. 
Chen and Kipping show that this wide scatter is mostly in the regime of Earth to Saturn masses, and other regimes have stronger mass radius correlations. In these plots, which show the same data, I compare the radius of a planet to a planet made of pure rock of the same mass as a proxy for its composition, or how big the planet is compared to its presumed rocky core and mantle. This is plotted against incident flux. The ratio of sizes of purely water worlds to rocky worlds varies very little over a wide range of mass. So here is the water line. Between the blue and brown lines, volatile rich planets could be water worlds or they could have deep atmospheres. Firstly, let's just appreciate that we have rocky planets characterized over four orders of magnitude in flux. Secondly, we see that the diversity in compositions for low mass planets declines with flux, consistent with atmospheric mass loss. All low mass planets above 300 Earth flux likely have rocky compositions. These ones here are all consistent with rock, with some exceptions in this purple box. This outlier is Kepler 4b, whose host has a sun-like effective temperature, but a radius of 1.5 solar radii, suggesting it may be evolving off the main sequence, perhaps increasing the planet's temperature and its radius, although it is more massive than Neptune, so perhaps it was just able to take the heat without losing mass. The other near exceptions here are Kepler 223b and c, and their host is also likely evolving off the main sequence. So if we exclude these three planets in the purple box, the boundary from volatile rich low mass planets to likely rocky low mass planets may be a very sharp one. The extreme low density low mass planets in the blue circle have lower incident fluxes. These super puffs are undetectable in RV, so they, uh, and they also appear a little bit isolated from other TTV planets at low incident flux. So they may very well be a separate population. We also have a growing sample of low mass planets at Earth-like incident flux in the green box, mostly at M dwarfs like TRAPPIST-1, LHS-1140, and K218, but also at Kepler-47, which is a circumbinary system. Just to highlight how much progress has been made in characterizing low mass exoplanets, this movie by Jason Rowe shows our advance towards the bottom of the mass radius diagram when Kepler-138 brought us into the sub-Earth regime. And here I lose my mouse, so I'll be one moment. There we go. More terrestrial exoplanets have been characterized, including Kepler-444, TRAPPIST-1, and Kepler-345b. Dressing et al. identified a pileup of well-characterized planets near an Earth-like composition between rock and metal. Nominally, there are lower densities in the regime below the radius valley, but their masses are uncertain and their compositions could be rocky. We'll return to them in a minute. More conclusively, given the detection bias towards high masses at a given radius, it does appear that densities higher than Earth's, supermercuries if you like, are unlikely at exoplanet systems. Interestingly, some of these rocky planets uh, have masses and radii uncertainties that are approaching the theoretical uncertainties in composition. For example, thermal effects in the equation of state may be important in modeling the metal content of Corot 7b and Kepler 10b. Another example, a 2% uncertainty in radius and a 6% uncertainty in mass may be enough to precisely constrain the core mass fraction. Kepler 36b is basically there. All right, let's return to this issue of whether, whether there are volatile rich planets below the radius valley. Most have enough uncertainty in their mass that they could be rocky. The nearest exceptions include TRAPPIST-1g, where the TTV model has all the compositions consistent with rock, although TRAPPIST-1g appears less dense than pure rock. Another possible exception is at Kepler-138. In 2015, we characterize the size of the outer two planets at 1.2 Earth radii, same size planets below the radius valley. The TTV strongly constrain the mass ratio of the two planets around three. That's what this joint posterior is showing. So if the middle planet is rocky, the outer planet must be volatile rich. However, the stellar radius measurements have varied a lot over the years. If both planets are larger than the radius valley, then we lose Kepler-138d as an example of a volatile rich super-Earth. 
However, increasing the planet sizes would also change the innermost planet, Kepler-138b, from 0.5 to 0.7 Earth radii. And its mass upper limit, around a Mars mass, would imply a density between rock and water. Kepler discovered many ultra-short period planets, or USPs. Their sizes are either poorly constrained or below two Earth radii, implying a complete loss of volatiles. Some of them have density low bounds from roastability that is consistent with a rocky composition. Early theoretical papers show that these could be formed from hot Jupiters that have lost their envelopes uh, due to Roche lobe overflow. However, USPs are observed to be more likely in multis with low mass neighbors, and recent theoretical progress has shown how they might be isolated in a planets among compact systems of sub-Neptunes. There are even a handful of known disintegrating planets revealed in the asymmetric transit profile of objects with the shortest orbital periods, including one discovered at a white dwarf. These are an incredible opportunity for the next decade. JWST will be able to probe the interiors of rocky exoplanets backlit by their host and directly constrain their compositions. Here are models by Bodman et al. showing minerals that can be distinguished by JWST in disintegrating planets. Let's return to the super pups. They're all warm. Uh, they have incident fluxes from 3 to 30 Earth flux. They're probably not common since only a few have been found despite the detection bias to low densities. As far as I know, they have not been seen outside the Kepler data set. If TESS observed one, it would probably be taken for a single planet system, and we would have to wait for RV upper limits on the mass to reveal the low density. Their compositions, uh, 10 to 40% hydrogen helium by mass, are in an awkward space. During formation, when envelope masses are comparable to the core mass, protoplanets should have rapid runaway accretion of a thick atmosphere. They also don't appear at a wide variety of spectral types. In this graph, I highlight the host properties and planet composition by symbol size, with planets more than three times larger than a rocky planet of the same mass, shown here in this color I call super puffy light gray, going down to sizes consistent with water in blue and rocky planets in brown. The hosts of super puff are of super puffs are typically late F or G. Uh, and for low mass planet compositions, this seems to be the only demographic that is limited by spectral type. We see denser planets, including rocky planets, at a wide range of spectral types. In other words, if there is some detection bias that makes super pups more common at F and G type stars, that detection bias does not appear to affect where we're able to characterize rocky planets. The known super pups are at fairly faint stars in the Kepler field. Nevertheless, their extreme atmospheric scale heights 2,700 kilometers for Kepler-51b, compared to eight kilometers for the Earth, makes their estimated transmission annuli uh, more than an Earth diameter thick. And the water band at 1.4 microns should be easily detectable in the cloud-free limit with HST. And yet we find three non-detections of water for Kepler-51b and D and Kepler-79d. Li and Chang allude to these planets as perhaps the exception to the rule if planets are formed in situ, with extreme low density planets forming in a gas poor environment beyond 1 AU before migrating in. This is consistent with the architecture of Kepler 51, but it is harder to explain Kepler 79, since the planet beyond the superpath, Kepler 79e, is a typical low density sub Neptune. These planets are on the mass loss threshold, and there is evidence that Kepler 51 is fairly young, 0.5 dig a year. Peter Gao has an atmospheric model to explain haze production at very low pressure from photochemistry, which would allow for the deep transits, and they would be very rare since the star has to be young. Kepler 79, around a year in age, is not that young, although it is the second youngest on the list of low density, low mass planet hosts. All right, let's talk about diversity within systems. Uh, Weiss et al found that planet sizes and spacings are correlated within systems. After accounting for detection biases, there's also some evidence that outer planets are larger than inner, oh, well, sorry, went ahead, than inner planets, um, first found by Sciardi et al during the Kepler mission. The set of characterized planet masses is too small to meaningfully compare with these results that are found in planet radii. Um, although it is worth noting that a planet of a particular radius could have a wide range of masses. Adams et al. show that equal spacing is an energy minimum for
for compact systems of planets with similar masses. And Mulders et al. Uh, found that similar, that similar spacing results naturally in planet formation from a wide variety of initial conditions, so long as the disk is smooth. All right, so here are some of the pods with odd Ps uh, where we have diverse planet neighborhoods. Uh, there are plenty of systems where a rocky inner planet is smaller than its low mass outer neighbors, consistent with mass loss and detection bias. Uh, including Kepler-10, Kepler-18, Kepler-36, and so on. These are not that surprising. A little bit more unusual is Kepler is 55 Cancri, whose extremely hot inner planet 55 Cancri E, which is a little bit too large to be rocky, has neighbors that are far too massive to be like one of Kepler's multis, with a combination of Jovian and sub masses within one AU. WASP-47 is another example with an ultra short period planet, a hot Jupiter and a Neptune, uh, all within nine days. Kepler's most diverse systems by mass include Kepler-30 with a Neptune, a Jovian and a Neptune all within 150 days. KY-1783 uh, also has a Neptune further out than a Saturn, which is reasonable in solar system, but very rare within one AU. Uh, Kepler-90 has almost solar system like diversity, but all within one AU. I've included the mass of planets here, although I promise to focus on low mass planets. There are a few systems with low mass planets who have denser low mass outer neighbors. These include Kepler-52, Kepler-105, and TOI-1266. All right, looking to the future, the compact systems of low mass planets are clearly unlike the salt system and characterizing their broader architectures is in its very early stages. Kepler found several multis with transiting Jovian planets uh, around 1 AU or beyond, including Kepler-90 and Kepler-289. Uh, RV has also found massive non-transiting outer planets in several Kepler systems. So is TTV, where there are many signals caused by non-transiting planets on planets with orbital periods beyond 150 days. These are seen in singles and multis in the Kepler data and are in the Holzer catalog. We also have dynamical constraints on our outer architectures. Multis have to remain very coplanar for all the observed planets to be transiting. In this plot from Lion Poo, you see that planets that are strongly secularly coupled remain coplanar no matter what is perturbing them. But if they're weakly coupled, their mutual inclinations reach twice the inclination of the perturber, making a co-transiting geometry unlikely. Becker and Adams showed that for typical Kepler systems, the distance out to which you can rule out massive perturbers is around 10 AU, although this varies a lot between systems, and the constraints are also very sensitive to undetected planets that may strengthen the coupling in a compact system. There are not many systems where these constraints uh, combine to inform on outer architectures. But let me illustrate what will be done with two examples. Here are two prototypical peas in a pod systems where all the planets are similar with the caveat that we don't know their outer architectures. Kepler-11 is a sun-like star with six sub-Neptunes, five of which are closer to Kepler-11 than Mercury is to the sun. Compactness like this in planetary systems was not anticipated before the Kepler mission. And here is TRAPPIST-1 drawn on the same scale, an ultra-cool dwarf with seven Earths, all of which are closer to TRAPPIST-1 then Kepler 11b is to Kepler 11. The outermost planet is just seven hundredths of an AU from the star. Despite its compactness, we will have better constraints on the outer architecture of TRAPPIST-1 than Kepler 11. Because Kepler 11 is faint, it's far away, it's not great for RV or astrometry, so the dynamical constraints on the outer architectures may be the best we have for some time. TRAPPIST-1, however, has a nice set of complementary constraints on the architecture beyond TRAPPIST-1h. From dynamics, TTVs rule out a Jovian mass planet out to about 0.3 AU. Coplanarity rules out a Jovian mass planet out to about 0.37 AU if inclined at one degree and further if the perturber has more inclination. Boss et al. show the pre gaia astrometric constraints on TRAPPIST-1 here in red. Astrometric signals increase with orbital distance, time permitting, and a 1.6 Jupiter mass planet is ruled out beyond 1.3 AU. So a TRAPPIST-1, a Jupiter mass planet could still be lurking somewhere between 0.37 and 1.6 AU. RV data from before the transiting planets were discovered rule out a Jupiter mass planet within about 0.2 AU. That is a weak constraint, but it is also at a precision of 380 meters per second 
which will obviously be improved upon. Since even though this is a faint M dwarf, around five meters per second is the expected precision for a range of telescopes on the ground. So the parameter space where massive planets could be detected or ruled out is shrinking quite rapidly for TRAPPIST-1. Finally, let's consider atmospheres. Firstly, we note that transmission spectra do not directly constrain bulk composition. A hydrogen-rich atmosphere could have detectable traces of water, uh, even if it is a minor component of the planet. Furthermore, the non-detection of water does not provide an upper limit on the bulk con water content, since many transmission spectra, spectra are flat from clouds and hazes. However, if you do detect water or any metals, this constrains the scale height and the mean molecular weight at a pressure level that you're observing. And this can inform mass loss and bulk composition models. Furthermore, in some cases, you may be able to break the degeneracy in hydrogen helium versus water as the volatile content of a planet that is denser than water, but less dense than rock. For example, Kepler-444 has subvenous sized hot planets around a very old star the planets are unlikely to retain any primordial hydrogen. Therefore, the detection of hydrogen mass loss in Lyman alpha absorption would favor a water-rich composition. In contrast, the detection of helium mass loss from a small planet would confirm the presence of a primordial atmosphere. HSD has not detected water in any exoplanet less massive than Neptune, although we are very close. So with JWST, the coming decade promises to be one where huge strides will be made in characterizing diverse low mass planets. So there I'll leave my conclusions. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you, Daniel. Let's start with some questions. James Owen asks, if there are if there are any evidence the majority of super puffs are young. Uh, is there any evidence that the super puffs are young? Yeah. So there is evidence that uh, Kepler 51 is young, uh, 0.5 giga year. Um, and the time scale over which atmospheric mass loss occurs uh, extends out to about a giga year. It's mostly in the first 100 mega year, but it, it just declines consistently over about a, a giga year. Um, Kepler 79, I think its nominal age is about 1.3 giga year, but there's enough uncertainty on that that it could be less than a giga year old. And that would make it the second youngest, and it's the second on the list of extreme low densities. So. Uh, there is evidence that they're younger than, than the average stars. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Jesse Christiansen asks, if you could get new transit time measurements for any system, which would it be? That is a great question, because there are so many. Uh, I, would, I would try and focus resources on um, planets that are at Venus-like distances uh, to push the boundary of mass characterization to, to a regime that has not been explored so far. So a lot of the Kepler systems have got TTV signals that extend longer than four years, longer than the Kepler baseline, and getting additional transit times on those systems where the orbital periods are a bit longer and the TTV periodicity is not well constrained will really give us a huge improvement in the masses of those planets. And so, uh, yes, uh, the more transit times you can get from the ground and from space would really be valuable in characterizing planets beyond Mercury-like distances. Okay, and uh, the final question for this talk will be of Sarah Milholland. Thank you for this excellent review. For the multi-transiting system with diverse masses, do we have anything in common in terms of stellar parameters, masses, metallicities? Um, it's hard to tell what's, what depends on, on detection biases. So I don't know if something like TRAPPIST-1 uh, would have been found around a sun-like star because it's just a very, very small star and you get deeper transits. So I think it's too early to answer that question. Okay, so one more question. We go, we have time. David Rice asks, in general, are we too fast to glance over the degeneracy in interior structures? I think you said something like supermercuries aren't observed, but couldn't any planet have a large core if some radius made up by atmosphere water? Yes, there is a degeneracy there. And so you could, if you have, 
a mixture of rock and metal, uh, you could still be smaller than this nominally rocky composition with some volatiles on top of that, because the metal adds, adds to the density, the bulk density. So yes, there is a degeneracy uh, even between rock and metal. And yes, you can always have volatiles in some of these planets. Although this pile up here is, does look like it's fairly real. I mean, it seems to follow the gradient of these curves as well. And so it looks like an Earth-like composition is kind of the upper limiting density for a wide range of characterized planets. Okay, so we thank Daniel and we can continue on to the next speaker. She is Sharon Wang from the Tsinghua University talking about inferring two small planet demographics with the Magellan Test Survey. So welcome, Sharon. Thank you. All right, one second as I share my screen. Start presenting. All right, um, hello from across the Pacific. I would like to thank the organizers for accommodating my time zone and moving my talk um, significantly earlier, which is really great for my sleeping house. Um, my name is Sharon Chisun Wang. I was a postdoc at Carnegie Observatories and I just um, recently moved to Tsinghua University as a uh, faculty and joining the Department of Astronomy. Um, I'm gonna tell you about our Magellan Test Survey. And I am speaking on behalf of our team, which is led by Dr. Johanna Tasky, who recently moved to Carnegie EPL at Washington DC as a staff scientist, and me and also Dr. Andy Wolfgang. We also have many team members across the globe, and I'm sure um, many of you guys among the audience are among our over 50 co-authors on our first paper, which is coming to archive soon. So please stay tuned. All right, so what do we do? We are a test follow-up survey to study the demographics of small planets. If you think of the demographics of small planets, um, as Daniel's just summarized very well, those two plots might pop up in your mind. The, left one being the mass radius relationship plot we've seen a million times, the pioneering work by Dr. Andrew Wolfgang in 2016, uh, where we learned things like how the mass radius relation has intrinsic scatters, which we can characterize as intrinsic to the population themselves, not just as the scatters you see from the measurements, and also how this relation changes as in uh, the composition changes at the turning point near 1.6 or 1.8 Earth radii. And the plot on the left, on the right hand side, which is a radius distribution of planets, as reviewed by Fulton et al., the radius gap, which naturally divides the population of small planets into super Earth and mini Neptunes. And this is sort of echoes with the mass radius relation and how things transition at the radius gap. And our survey revolves around the theme of what made super Earth and mini Neptunes. Right. In the formation and evolution processes, what are the factors that determine the fate of a planet where it lands? This is a fascinating question we're um, set up to answer. All right, so uh, one focus point of our survey is uh, naturally the mass radius relation. This is a suite of um, three flavors of mass radius relation on the left again by Wolfgang et al. And in the middle, you've seen this again in Daniel's talk chain, like keeping it all with uh, increasing complexity, extending the radius to higher uh, radius, uh, the axis to higher radius and higher masses. And also the most recent work by Neil and Rogers with even increasing uh, complexity and, and accuracy, including three populations of planets with gaseous envelope and two types of rocky planets, right? So we really learned a fair amount um, about small planets through these studies, but the theorist is not satisfied. For example, we want to learn more about this transition point near the radius gap, right? What are the properties of this transition region? What are, what are the planets in there? Are there gases or rocky? What determines that? And also, for example, in China, keeping in the small planet range, in the very, very small range, right? Can we please just stop using just solar system? Can we add some real observational data that are very well characterized, minimized of observational bias and with robust characterization? Right. And, and thirdly, uh, for example, in Neil Rogers' paper, they noted that for the rocky planet composition, we don't have observational constraints, so they had to use pure theoretical mass radius relationship. Can we do some um, real constraints in that regime? 
right? So theorists cried out for more data. As observers, we deliver them more data. And even better, we deliver them better data. So if you're well worse in the mass radius world, you know that the data behind these relationships are very much subject to observational bias. Uh, for that, I mean, for example, as observers, we have we tend to have the bad habit of stopping our observations when we think it's good enough. Good enough very often means that we are constrained the RVA sigma amplitude or the mass of the planets to like say arbitrary sigma, three sigma or something. And that could bias us very much towards the heavy heavy end, right? And that could go into our population inferences. All right, so what do we do to address that? As MTS, we mind the statistics, right? And we also document everything. So this is the philosophy behind our survey. We're not doing a random survey to follow a, a random collection of planets, but we, uh, we draft our survey from uh, ground up all the way from target selection to cadence design to statistical study, we make sure that every step is um, carefully designed so that we could minimize bias in there and enable observation, uh, enable population studies uh, so that maybe you can simulate the whole process in the computer, for example. We do have a, for example, let me bring up the pointer, the target selection function uh, so that you can reproduce that with population synthesis. And we have a careful cadence design. We have a flow chart which we've agonized over every single detail of. And finally, we do a um, pipeline uniform analysis of our observational data and perform statistical studies using things like hierarchical Bayesian modeling, which I just learned uh, apparently 538 also uses, which turned out to be a fairly good predictor for the presidential election results. And um, we think, we think of course, for the population study as well, as we've learned. So our survey revolves around three themes, uh, three science themes that goes be beyond the mass radio relation. Uh, to study what I call secondary statistics, which would tell us more behind the mass radius relation. The first one being how did stellar irradiation receive that planets shaped, shaped the atmosphere of planets? And how do elemental balances of whole stars affect the box composition of planets? And finally, last but not least, what role did system architecture play and by system architecture, I mean things like additional planets in the system, non-transient ones or a long period transient ones, uh, and things like eccentricity and neutral inclination, obliquity, anything that give you a holistic picture of the system. So these are our three science themes and our survey was designed to maximize science return uh, around those three questions. All right, so how exactly do we do it? We follow up 30 small planets discovered by tests with radio velocities uh, taken by our beloved instrument, Planet Finder Spectrograph on the Magellan Clay Telescope down in Chile. We also use other uh, ground-based data to facilitate our survey, of course. And as you know, if you combine photometry with the radio velocities, you get a whole bunch of measurements for those system properties, things like radius, masses easily, and then eccentricities, system architecture, like I mentioned. And also as a natural product of radio velocity follow-up, you get a high resolution stellar spectral of whole stars. So you have stellar properties well-derived and also stellar elemental abundances, which could really link planet formation to the outcome of the planet. All right, just to show you an example of exactly what we do, here is a um, selected sample of planets, their phased RV curve. So as you can see, we've collected quite a bunch of data. Our survey is about halfway done. Um, we gather the RV data. We also do our own analysis of the test like curve. We uh, fit the RV curves and extract system properties, things like masses. Right, so for our first paper, we present some preliminary results using those uh, initial results from our um, uh, halfway done survey. This is one of our preliminary results, our first mass radius relation derived with 20 planets, which we were able to characterize with our survey so far. This is a plot and work generated by Dr. Andy Wolfgang. This is a planet radius, yes, 
planet masses and the different colored contours are the mass and radius constraints of the planets in our sample. And notably, there are three upper limits, the three triangles in there, they very much go into our modeling as well. We do not throw away any data. This is very critical for minimizing the bias. And um, I want to draw your attention to three features, very fascinating features on this plot. The first one being that the green curve, which is our derived mass radius relation, is narrower than the green ones, which are the previously derived mass radius relation. The dotted line being from Chen and Keeping, and the dashed line from Wolfgang et al. 2016. And the reason being, we think, one, we have a smaller sample that could have a relatively larger error bar. So the modeling is telling us that the intrinsic scatter from the population is extremely small, and that could be just caused by our limited by our sample. But two, it could be also telling us that it's just intrinsically smaller than the previous ones because our sample, unlike the previous ones, were bottom heavy. We have a larger number of small planets um, with masses smaller than 10 Earth masses uh, in comparison to the samples that used in previous studies. And the second feature is, as you notice, that the, the slope of the gray curve and the, the slope of the green curves are different. And this is also a natural result because of the gray curves, including larger planets. So we think this is very natural. It's also sort of telling us the transition that happens beyond the 1.6 Earth radii and the fact that we're using a single parallel relationship. And uh, most, per perhaps the most fascinating feature is feature number three on this plot, which is that the green curve and the dotted curve both pass the one Earth radius and one Earth mass point but the dash curve does not. The reason why the dotted curve, the trend and keeping relation passes the Earth's point is because they forced the curve to do so by including solar system planets. And we did not include solar system planets, but we still successfully recovered this relationship extrapolating down to the lower mass, which is really great. But the dashed curve is the biased estimate because the previously published results have masses that tend to be a little large due to the bias I mentioned where observers like to cut things off when we think we reach three sigma measurements and, and such. All right, just very quickly, this is another results um, just showing our, again, mass radius contours overlaid with composition curves. Uh, so the gray shaded region is the one where I want you to focus is the rocky terrestrial regime, right? And one interesting feature of this plot is that, as you can see, once the radius of the planet uh, goes beyond something like 1.7 Earth radii, it's like those planets that just launch off from the rocky terrestrial uh, radius, right? That they start to have substantial uh, gaseous envelope, which we could not uh, could not ignore in the modeling. So this is again echoing with the previous result. And for the future, we're gonna um, add more uh, sophisticated components to our say the hierarchical Bayesian modeling for the mass radius relation, and potentially including things like population synthesis uh, to further characterize the underlying population. Um, and please stay tuned. I'll leave my summary up and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Let's move to the Q&A window for some questions. So let me try one. Uh, how do you uh, choose your targets? That's a good question. So we draw from the release the TOIs and then we start by assuming they're all real planets and then we pass them through this merit function, which we prioritize things in the radius gap, prioritize things that receive lower installation flux and also prioritize things that could be characterized with radio velocities realistically, right? Then we, we cut, out, cut it off at some threshold and further down that, uh, further down we vet the targets to make sure they, they're not false positives or stars that you could not do really well to bit. And then we come up with a list of 30. Okay, thank you. One more question from Gis Mulders. Do you see any evidence for a period dependence in the mass radius relation? Uh, we have not run our sample uh, through a period mass radius relation. Uh, 
in, in any details yet. I, I, I think a quick glance that is inconclusive because we don't have um, a large sample yet or, 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 or a super well constrained sample. Okay, one more question from Eric Ford. Could you see more about the regime of one Earth mass and 1.5 Earth uh, ready planet? It looks like they, it looks like you are quite confident that it has significant gas. Am I reading that right? Uh, I thought it was the opposite. It seems to, the, th the thing is, it looks like the things that below 1.7 Earth radii really, all tend to have, they, they all tend not to have significant gas. So the, so, so the outlier over there, that super long, slim contour, this is not a very well constrained planet. Okay, thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you. Now we can to Ryan Kluger from Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He will present to us sculpting, sorry, sculpting the closing planet population across the main sequence. Welcome, Ryan. Apologies, I was muted and sharing the screen. All right, um, so thank you all very much. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here to review the current state of knowledge on the population of small close-in planets and uh, specifically planets that are, are spanning the radius valley, not only around uh, sun-like stars, but all the way down to uh, the M dwarfs or the low mass stars at the end of the main sequence. Um, but, but just before I begin, um, and this apparently doesn't matter to most of you who are attendees, but for the panelists, um, if you want to see my face during the talk, I've just sort of etched out the top right corner here uh, of all my slides. So you can just sort of move my face up to the top right and uh, you'll be sure not to miss any of the slides content. So I thought I would start off by first searching the ADS for, for these types of keywords, right? And to look at the number of papers that have focused on the radius valley over time. And, uh, and what I saw was basically what I expected in that the community's interest uh, in this subject basically exploded uh, after the firm discovery of the Radius Valley by the California, uh, California Kepler uh, survey team back in 2017. And so in this talk, uh, I wanna discuss some of the major ideas that have stemmed from that discovery and how our view of the Radius Valley has influenced our understanding of close-in planets that are smaller than Neptune. Uh, so my plan first is to summarize the implications that the Radius Valley has on the compositions of small planets. Then I'm gonna give an overview of some of the physical processes uh, that have been proposed to explain the emergence of the radius valley and what current lines of evidence we have to support or refute those ideas around different types of stars. And then lastly, I wanna leave you with some thoughts going forward on uh, how we can use current facilities to more firmly establish what physics drives the emergence of the radius valley uh, across the entire main sequence. So, so here it is, right? One of, the, one of the most important results in exoplanet demographics over the past decade or so, uh, which is this bimodal distribution in the occurrence rate of small close in planets around FGK stars. And so now this feature, this bimodal feature is a consequence of the existence of a transition from small rocky planets whose internal structures are reminiscent of the earth to larger planets that are non-rocky, or at least they cannot be solely made up of, of rock and iron. And so looking at the mass radius diagram, uh, we confirm that small planets, ones that are below the, the valley, largely follow this Earth-like compositional curve uh, with about a third of their mass in the iron core and then surrounded by a silicate mantle and with very little atmosphere. But for the larger planets on the opposite side of the valley, their compositional makeup is degenerate with these overlapping interior structure models because from just knowing the planet's mass and radius, you cannot infer a unique combination of iron, uh, rock, ice, and gas. That is that in, in this region of the parameter space where there are multiple internal structure models overlapping, 
on an individual planet basis, you cannot identify a planet as being either a water world or instead as being something like an Earth-like core that, that hosts a substantial hydrogen helium envelope. But now fortunately, akin to measuring planet masses with radial velocities or TTVs, the average planet size of this second peak can be used to infer the underlying core composition of this particular subpopulation. But unlike measuring the masses of individual planets like, like you might be used to with RVs or TTVs, here we are going to model the atmospheric evolution of these planets uh, to try and gain a sense of what that population is likely made up of. And so let, let's first just consider an initially homogeneous population of Colson planets that start off with uh, similar envelope mass fractions, similar core masses, and similar core compositions, and then place them at a range of orbital separations and evolve their atmospheres under the effects of some sort of thermally uh, driven atmospheric mass loss process. You find that the average radius of the second peak that we actually observe, it's inconsistent with those planets having underlying core compositions that are either water rich or iron rich. Instead, the only way that you can replicate the average planet size of the second peak is by insisting that the underlying core compositions are very much Earth-like. Right? And that the reason that they appear to be so large is just because you have these Earth-like cores that have been able to retain a hydrogen helium envelope that only accounts for a few percent uh, of the planet's mass, but it inflates the planet's radius hugely to about twice the size of the underlying rocky core. And so in this way, the core is what dominates the planet masses, such that this underlying distribution of core masses is it's not bimodal, it's, it's smooth. And it indicates that planets in both peaks of the radius valley, they have similar masses with little to no contribution from the hydrogen helium envelopes. And uh, I guess it's, it's worth noting that although this particular result that I'm showing, uh, it assumes that the atmospheres have been lost of photo evaporation, there have been other studies that have shown that this result is largely robust to the exact mechanism of atmospheric escape. So there's additional evidence for the second planet peak in the radius valley corresponding to enveloped rocky planets rather than to water worlds. And that is that while the atmospheres of enveloped terrestrials are easily stripped away under extremely high levels of insulation, the additional stability that you get from a thin water world atmosphere because of the atmosphere's high metallicity and being water dominated, those atmospheres are much more robust against the effects of thermally driven hydrodynamic escape, even at these extremely high levels of insulation. So if water worlds, right, planets that form beyond the ice line and then they migrate inwards to the orbits that we see today, if those water worlds form a significant subset of the close in planet population, then we expect to see those planets with water world-like compositions on ultra short period orbits. And we just don't, right? So this is this fact is illustrated here by uh, the subset of planets with strong compositional constraints and with orbital periods of less than a day. And you see that almost all of them are consistent with this Earth-like compositional curve, uh, with there only being really one clear exception, and that's the, the well-known outlier, 55 Cangri E, uh, which may require a more sort of exotic uh, interpretation that I won't be talking about today. So returning now to this question of what is the most likely, co likely composition of this second planet peak? Well, the study of this population seems to suggest that they are predominantly Earth-like planetary cores that are enveloped in hydrogen helium gas. And so in this way, the radius valley doesn't really reflect a transition from rocky to non-rocky planets. Instead, it's going to reflect a transition from rocky to enveloped planets. So basically a more uniform planet population that is predominantly rocky. And but just with some of those planets having hosted a hydrogen helium envelope that is substantial in terms of the planet size, but only contributes a few percent to the planet's mass. Okay, so moving on, uh, now I wanna propose some of the explanations um, for the emergence of the radius valley. But I wanna, I really wanna preface this section by noting that you know, we could really probably dedicate separate review talks to each of these physical models. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to focus on a few key model predictions that they make that we're later on going to compare to the observations. Uh, so in general, we have two classes of models that can explain the emergence of the radius valley. 
at, at least in a qualitative manner. But in practice, these processes are not going to be mutually exclusive, but they do have certain unique observational signatures that we can try to use to tease out which process, if any, is dominant around different types of stars. And so the first physical model is that of photoevaporation, wherein a newly formed planet is bombarded with high energy radiation from the host star when the star is young and active, which is typically about uh, 100 million years or so for sun-like stars, but can exceed a few billion years for the lower mass M dwarfs. And in this picture of photoevaporation, the planet's upper atmosphere is heated by this incident XUV flux, and that drives atmospheric mass loss by a bulk hydrodynamic flow. And so if you do the hydrodynamic simulations, they reveal that the XUV insulation required to strip the atmosphere of a planet, a planet of a given solid core mass, that scales as the solid mass to the positive 2.4. And then this translates to a dependence of the central radius of the valley that scales with insulation to the plus 0.11 or orbital period to the negative 0.15. So larger and more massive planetary cores will require higher levels of insulation to have their atmosphere stripped. And this is illustrated here where you can see that the effect of this negative, uh, this negative period dependence on a simulated population of planets that have been sculpted by photoevaporation. And then secondly, without deriving it, uh, I'm just gonna sort of posit that the photoevaporation model predicts that the radius valley should have uh, the following stellar mass dependence. Uh, if it's true that more massive planetary cores are forming around more massive stars, which is an observational result that we're gonna revisit uh, a little bit later on. So another form of thermally driven mass loss is that of core powered mass loss, whereby the lower atmosphere is heated by the hot planetary core after formation. And this heating slowly drives atmospheric escape over billions of years. And so in this scenario, the cooling rate of the atmosphere is actually set by the diffusion of heat across the atmosphere's radiative uh, convective boundary or the RCB. And then that diffusion rate is largely set by the temperature at the RCB, which can be well approximated by just the planet's equilibrium temperature. And this happens in such a way that it leads to, uh, again, a scaling of the radius valley that is, again, positive with insulation or negative with orbital period, and with actually fairly similar power law dependencies as we just saw in the photo evaporation scenario. And then if we link the planet's equilibrium temperature, which matters a lot, to the stellar luminosity, and we use a stellar mass luminosity relation that is parameterized by uh, this alpha power law index, then we arrive at this stellar mass dependence in the core powered mass loss scenario, which for sun-like stars works out to be about uh, 0.35 power law index. Uh, so switching now to in situ formation class, class of models. So here we're concerned with the formation of both rocky and enveloped planets from a gas pore, but not a gas empty disk. Okay, so in this model, um, in situ rocky planet cores are still able to accrete envelopes of a few percent during the transitional disk phase, when you can see that the gas density has become significant, significantly depleted. Right? So you have these solid protoplanets that are fed gas from the outer disk, and they're still able to build up a few percent in a, in a gaseous envelope mass fraction and form the second peak in the radius valley before the disk's lifetime, before the end of the disk's lifetime. And numerical calculations of this process indicate that even without the subsequent effects of, of evaporation, we can still form this characteristic bimodality um, by forming enveloped terrestrials in a gas poor environment, and then also having planets that we observe to be rocky, these plants down here, having them form at early times, but having their cores that are less massive than about one, one or two Earth masses, and thus having insufficient mass to accrete the hot gas from the close-in regions of the disk. And so the punchline of this is being that, similarly to the thermally driven mass loss processes that I just discussed, gas poor formation calculations also indicate that the radius valley should have a positive scaling with insulation or a negative scaling with the orbital period. It, it's basically the same as what we saw with the thermally driven mass loss. But now we have this one last process, which is gas empty formation. Okay, so now this is the process that people uh, typically think of when they hear gas pore formation. 
but this is gas empty formation and it actually precludes the existence of any gas during the terrestrial planet formation process. Really similar to how we think the inner solar system formed in a gas empty environment. So here we have enveloped planets that you know, form as usual within the first few million years. But then after the disk disperses completely, we are just left with some inventory of solid material uh, that has been enhanced in mass by the outer disk, radial transport from the outer disk. And it forms the minimum mass extrasolar nebula, which if you integrate the minimum mass extrasolar nebula over the feeding zone of a protoplanet at a distance A, you find that the maximum solid mass scales with the orbital distance to the 0 0.06 which translates to an insulation dependence that is negative or an orbital period dependence that is positive. And now these dependencies, these ones are actually unique compared to each of the three previous models. And that effect is sort of depicted here by these, these simulated planets, which instead of them getting smaller as you move further away from the star, they actually become more massive and become larger at large orbital distances. And so that's very unique. So the next obvious question is, how do all of these model predictions actually compare to the observations? So here again is the radius valley. Uh, and this is based on the same uh, FGK stars that were in the original CKS study as a function of planet radius and insulation. And you can see that we have these two peaks that are separated by a valley whose slope exhibits a positive power law dependence with insulation. And so if you recall the model predictions, such a positive slope is consistent with physical models of thermally driven atmospheric mass loss, things like photo evaporation or core power mass loss, and with the gas pore formation scenario. And it is clearly inconsistent with predictions from the gas empty formation scenario. So this, this was uh, from the CKS study. These stars were based on the original CKS study. But after the release of uh, Gaia DR2, we now find ourselves in a position where we can refine the stellar parameters of low mass stars and try to investigate the planet occurrence around stars that had been excluded from this sample. And specifically, we wanted to look at planets orbiting uh, mid K to mid M dwarfs and to see number one, does the radius valley still emerge? And two, does the radius valley structure differ at all from what we're seeing here around the FGK stars? And so here are the results of that investigation. And so even though in this regime, we have an order of magnitude fewer planets around these types of stars than around the FGK stars from Kepler, we nevertheless see the radius valley emerge with the enveloped planet peak here and then the rocky planets down here. And you can also clearly see that the slope of the valley with insulation is now negative. And it's inconsistent with the slope that was previously detected around the FGK stars. And so if we compare them side by side, you can see that going from the FGK stars on the left to the lower mass stars on the right, the slope appears to flip its sign. And it goes from being consistent with a thermally driven mass loss process or with gas pore formation to instead being consistent with the gas empty formation model, like, like how we think the inner solar system was formed. And so the interpretation of this, of this sign flip, is that around increasingly lower mass stars, we may be witnessing the emergence of a separate channel of terrestrial planet formation in which small rocky planets fail to ever accrete a primordial hydrogen helium envelope. They just never start off with one. They're always rocky, born rocky. Okay. And now looking forward, uh, I wanna focus on some of the ways that we might be able to indeed identify whether or not we are actually witnessing the emergence of the gas empty formation process around low mass stars. And is there a well-defined stellar mass at which that transition occurs? So around M dwarfs, which is basically where we think this transition occurs, if it occurs, we have that the dominant physics sculpting the radius valley is not clearly identifiable from planet occurrence rates alone. We just don't have the statistics yet. But in this parameter space, we are left with two predicted locations for the rocky envelope transition, either from a thermally driven mass loss process or from gas empty formation. And now because these models predict different slopes for the rocky envelope transition, they naturally carve out this shaded region of interest where the model predictions disagree on what the bulk compositions of planets should look like. 
right? So, so any planets that are down here below the shaded regions, both models expect those planets to be rocky. Whereas any planets above the shaded regions are expected to be enveloped. And then any intermediate planets uh, in the shaded regions, they will have opposing bulk composition expectations that differ between these two classes of models. So the observational goal here is to characterize the bulk compositions um, of planets, of transiting M dwarf planets within the shaded region, basically what, what I call keystone planets, and to see if they're predominantly rocky and thus favor a thermally driven mass loss process, or if they're predominantly enveloped and would therefore favor the gas empty formation model. So here are the current uh, 17 M dwarf planets with at least a three sigma RV mass measurement. And I've classified them as being either rocky or as enveloped based on uh, those masses and radii. And you can see that among them, there are only two keystone planets, right? The first one is TOI 1235b. It's a massive rocky planet orbiting an M0 dwarf. And because we know that it has a rocky composition, that is consistent with a thermally driven mass loss process and indicates that mass loss is likely to still be efficient at sculpting the radius valley around these earliest uh, M dwarfs. And then there's also 776b, uh, which orbits an M1 dwarf. And it was shown to have a bulk composition that was inconsistent with the Earth and therefore likely requires a significant hydrogen helium envelope, which if you just take that at face value appears to be inconsistent with the thermally driven mass loss process. Um, but I, personally, I think that, that interpretation is a little bit less clear just because the size of 776b is, is still consistent with lying above this boundary. And the boundary itself has some associated uncertainty. So I think the real power in characterizing planets like 776b, uh, basically planets that are close to either of these boundaries, will be in their ability to help us to refine the exact location of the rocky to envelop transition around M dwarfs and then to do that over a range of M dwarf masses to see if it changes with stellar mass. And then in addition to these two confirmed planets, TESS has already contributed about 25 keystone planet candidates. So really there's plenty of opportunities for us to target uh, these keystone planets for precise mass characterization, and consequently to test the validity of either of these two radius valley emergence models by studying individual planets. Right? So we can, we can still learn a lot about the dominant physics around M dwarfs just by focusing on individual planets, which is something that is you know, much less intensive than working to uncover the entire planet occurrence rates from large transit surveys. So it's something that I think is very complementary. And then still in this vein uh, of using mass characterization, one more strategy that we can use to test the prevalence of gas empty formation around M dwarfs is to target small planets with orbital periods greater than about 20 days. Because at these large separations, the typical mass loss timescales exceed the ages of the system, such that if these planets turn out to be predominantly rocky, they must have formed rocky. And that would support these planets forming uh, at late times after the dispersal of the protoplanetary disk gas. Okay. So the last point I wanna make is to now propose one more strategy that can be used to distinguish between the various emergence models. And that is by looking at the dependence of the location of the radius valley uh, on stellar mass, with stellar mass. And then comparing those measurements to the model predictions that we derived earlier. So looking at about a thousand Kepler planets around FGK stars, uh, Fulton and Pettigura showed that there's at least a qualitative agreement with the model predictions in that the radius valley appears to shift to larger planet sizes with increasing stellar mass. And that's supported by the idea from Yenshin Wu that more massive planetary cores form around increasingly massive stars. And then in my recent work where we extended the radius valley down to the uh, lower mass stars, the location of the radius valley uh, appears to continue this trend, right, of decreasing planet size with decreasing stellar mass. But our statistics are limited in that we cannot firmly distinguish between any of these model predictions in part because really the median stellar mass of this, of our sample of K and M dwarfs, the model predictions are still relatively tight. They're still kind of clustered together. So really what we would like to do is we'd like to push down to even lower stellar masses where the models tend to diverge more significantly. But right now the uncertainties uh, around these stars from just Kepler and K2, they're really, they're nowhere close to where we need them to be for us to distinguish between the models. But if we can refine the precision on the location of the radius valley around these mid to late M dwarfs, 
then we may be able to establish one of these models as the dominant mechanism around these very low mass stars. So yesterday, um, Scott Gowdy admitted that, you know, by its design, TESS is a poor demographics mission. And, and that's largely true. But there are pockets of the planetary parameter space where it can still be effective for statistics. And this is one of those pockets, right? It's exactly what we're interested in, these, these small close implants around red mid to late M doors. And so to capitalize on this opportunity, we actually have an ongoing uh, guest investigator program for test cycles three and four. And we're going to target 12,000 mid to late M dwarfs to measure the close in planet occurrence. And so here I'm just showing you the expected uncertainty on the radius values location that we expect to get by the end of test cycle four, which, you know, if just as an example, if gas empty formation turns out to be the dominant mechanism around these late type M dwarfs, then we would be able to rule out photo evaporation at about three and a half sigma in this low stellar mass regime. Okay. So I see that I'm almost out of time. So I'm just gonna leave you uh, with my conclusions in that the radius valley, right? We've seen that it indicates that planets between 1.8 and three Earth radii are likely to be enveloped terrestrials rather than water worlds. And this is supported by the lack of ultra short period water worlds. And then the dominant mechanism for sculpting the radius valley is likely stellar mass dependent in that the FGK stars seem to favor a thermally driven mass loss process. Whereas there's evidence that gas empty formation may emerge around early to mid M doors. And then lastly, uh, the emergence models have unique dependencies on stellar parameters. And we can use those dependencies to test the models all the way across the main sequence, right? So we talked about the insulation period dependence, which you can get from population studies and characterizing the masses of individual planets. We talked about the stellar mass dependence, which you can get from population studies. And then there are others, uh, other dependencies that I, I didn't have time to discuss, but there are things like using multi-transiting systems, um, calculating the X-ray exposure, stellar metallicity, uh, and stellar age, which is actually something that we're going to hear about in, I think, the very next talk uh, from Travis Berger. So uh, I will stop there, and I'm happy to take questions here or in Slack. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, let's start with some questions. James Owen asks, comment. If gas empty formation is more common around late type stars, we should see less planetary systems that straddle the gap than around earlier type stars. Does this hold up? Um, I don't necessarily think that I follow the logic in the statement. Um, Maybe you can clarify here or afterwards, but it's not obvious to me that that would be true. Okay, okay. So it's going to be in the Slack channel for discussion. Nader Hagibur asks, Ryan, in your study, did you take into account the internal evolution of the planets you studied like tectonics, mantle core interaction? Um, in, our, in our population study, we certainly did not. We were completely agnostic to, um, to the compositions of the planets, and we were just looking at them as a function of, of orbital period and planet radius. Um, if you're if you're just um, asking about some of the the RV planets that uh, we characterize sort of after the fact, things like 1235b, uh, no, we didn't go into that much detail uh, when it came to uh, characterizing the composition of that of that particular planet. It was just sort of having a precise mass measurement, having a precise radius measurement, and comparing that to the uh, internal structure models and basically seeing that it's it's consistent with the Earth. It's basically a very massive scaled up version of the Earth, basically as massive as you can get without having to add on a significant amount of uh, hydrogen helium. Okay, thank you. Now, Jonathan Think ask, since photoevaporation and core power mass loss has uh, an age dependence, do you think accurate age measurements will be important in making a strong inference about the Keystone planet? Uh, absolutely, I do. I think there are a number of different model predictions, particularly between uh, photoevaporation and core powered mass loss, um, many of which are very similar and difficult to tease out, uh, but many of which are distinct. Uh, reasonably distinct that they there should be a, an observational signature that we would be able to find. And I think, to me anyway, uh, that stellar age is one of the uh, best opportunities to do that. 
Um, and particularly for myself who are focused on MDORS, I would love to be able to get the ages of MDORS to try to extend that down. But I mean, things like gyrochronology just do not work as well. So I think at least around the sun-like stars, uh, determining accurate stellar ages um, for systems of, of transiting planets is, is going to be a, a very powerful tool for distinguishing between those two uh, physical processes. But again, uh, you know, we don't expect those processes to be mutually exclusive, right? We expect them to be ongoing to some degree. Um, so a lot of these, um, a lot of us being able to distinguish between the two, it's not going to be so clear cut. But I, I do think stellar age is going to be one of the more powerful ways that we can try and tease out which one is more dominant, if if either. Okay. Thank you very much, Ryan. You. Let's move on to the next speaker. He is Travis Berger for the, from the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii, talking about the stellar age dependence of the planetary radius gap. Welcome, Travis. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think the screen is still being shared. It's not on my oh. side. Okay, so let me actually okay. try. Uh, okay, here we go. Okay. No. Can you see my screen? No, we can't. Okay, let me stop. Ryan, did you actively stop sharing? I did. I just see Travis's sort of blank screen. Okay. Let me well, see. We see your screen though. Yeah, we still see your conclusion slide. Do you? Um, okay. <laughs> Do you see my inbox now? No. So something <laughs> is just frozen. Well, something I is think. frozen. Yeah. Uh, I can try resharing. Here, have an inbox. Uh oh, now we see your mouse moving. Yeah. I have. Oh, let me okay. try to stop it from our end. Thanks, Ellen. Someone says they can see Travis's screen okay. now. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so let me try this again. Yeah. Okay, can everyone yes. see my screen now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to the conference organizers for allowing me to speak here today. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking about a stellar age dependence of the planet radius gap. Um, and this is work that I've done with collaborators Dan Huber, Jen Van Saders, Eric Guidos, Jamie Tyer, Lauren Weiss, and Adam Krauss. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so um, here, um, as we heard about uh, just in the last talk, um, is this uh, planet radius gap um, from Fulton et al. 2017, which shows the number of planets per star on the y-axis or occurrence rate versus the planet size here on the x-axis. Um, and what it shows is that we have this gap in the distribution of small exoplanets um, separating the super Earths down here at about 1.3 or so Earth radii from the sub Neptunes up here at about 2.4 Earth radii. Um, sorry, and sorry, Travis, we are not seeing your presentation. <laughs> okay. You are let not me... sharing, I think. Yeah, let me let me try this again. Okay. Yeah. Now, yes. Can you <laughs> see? You. Can you see? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's let's back up. Okay, so um, so here, so you guys can see it all now. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so here is the um, planet radius gap plot from Fulton et al. 2017 that Ryan just talked about in a lot of details. I'm just going to kind of try to go through this pretty quickly. So showing the number of planets per star on the y-axis or occurrence rate versus planet size on the x-axis, and obviously the major discovery. Um, and um, showing of this plot is this planet radius gap in the distribution of small exoplanets separating our super Earths down here at about 1.3 Earth radii from the sub Neptunes up here at about 2.4 or so Earth radii. And a lot of this was made possible thanks to the very precise stellar properties of the California Kepler survey. Now, in recent years, a lot of people have asked questions such as how the gap varies as a function of incident flux, orbital period. Um, stellar mass. And I think in particular, um, as Ryan mentioned earlier, um, how it varies as a function of stellar age will definitely be something important moving forward from here. And I'm going to try to address that a little bit myself today. Um, and so we need to come up with some sort of 
gap formation mechanism. Again, Ryan covered a lot of these um, competing theories in the last talk, but I'm just going to kind of go over them real quickly here. And today I'm going to be mainly discussing two competing theories. One that we heard about, um, photo evaporation, which uses very high energy XUV um, and EUV radiation from the host star, usually within its first 100 million years or so, when it's young and active. Um, and this strips planet atmospheres. And then second, I'll talk about um, core powered mass loss, uh, which uses a combination of the bolometric luminosity from the host star in combination with the core luminosity left over from the planet's heat from formation. And the combination of those two factors end up resulting in planets losing, losing their atmospheres. And this is expected to happen on roughly giga year time scales. But again, there's, there's a little bit of wiggle room there in both photo evaporation and core powered mass loss. So in terms of how they actually describe um, the observations, um, so um, if we look at photo evaporation, we've got our models over here on the left from Onan Rue 2017 showing planet radius versus orbital period. Darker colors here indicate higher planet densities or higher occurrences of planets. And over here on the right, we can see our observations from Fulton et al. 2017. And overall, I think what we can say is based on um, these two plots, we see good qualitative agreement, um, as was mentioned before. Um, and in addition, if we look at core powered mass loss, we again look at the models over here on the left, which come from Gupta and Schlichting 2019, and the observations on the right from Fulton and Pettigura 2018. And again, we see this qualitative agreement between where the expected occurrence rates are supposed to be highest and where we actually measure those occurrence rates to be highest. And so then this leads to the question, well, how do we go about differentiating between these two theories if both have described the observations pretty well so far. And so you might be able to think about a few different avenues for how we could do this. Um, one, you might wanna look at different areas of parameter space, um, but then you might also want to look at, for instance, more precise stellar properties, um, and in particular, increasing the sample of planets. Um, so now, where were things back uh, before Gaia DR2? So here is a plot from Mathur et al. 2017, um, showing the isochrone modeled stellar radii versus effective temperatures. Um, and what we can see here is that there might be some interesting areas of this diagram, for instance, um, results kind of latching on to a model grid. Um, we've got some not a very clear red clump going on up here. Um, and then also you'll notice that there aren't too many subgiant stars. And then there's also this um, gap in the distribution of effective temperatures for cool stars. What I want to stress here is that the median fractional radius precisions at this time were at about 25% or so because most of the stars at this point in time only had photometric constraints on their um, stellar radii. Now, how do things change when we implement Gaia DR2 parallaxes? Well, we see that things sharpen up very nicely. I'm going to flip back and forth once more. And what you'll notice is that no longer are we getting, you know, latching on to a clear model grid for some of the hot stars. We have a very clearly defined um, red giant branch and in particular red clump. Um, we have more stars that are subgiants. Um, and then also we're not getting this gap in the distribution of effective temperatures for some of the cool stars. But what I really want to focus on here is that we're getting down to median fractional radius precisions of 4%, a factor of 8 better than what we were getting before Gaia DR2. And then I also want to stress that we have masses, ages, densities, and more for every single star within this diagram. So then this leads to the question, well, what can we do with all of these brand new stellar properties? And what can we learn about the planets that orbit these stars? So here we've got our planet radius on the y-axis versus incident flux now on the x-axis. And points here are colored according to the stellar mass of their host star, with brighter colors indicate higher stellar, stellar masses. The um, solid points here are confirmed planets, and the translucent points are candidate planets. And if you've got a particularly keen eye, you might have noticed that there appears to be a color gradient going from right to left on this plot. And this indicates that there is a stellar mass gradient. Now, if we naively assume that the orbital periods of planets are roughly the same around different mass stars, now we know that that's not necessarily the case, but at least based on how strongly uh, stellar luminosity is based on stellar mass, 
This is essentially what we end up seeing here because more massive stars produce higher luminosities. And therefore, if planets are at roughly equal orbital periods, they should be receiving larger amounts of incident flux, which is exactly what we see. Um, in addition, you might notice that there appears to be an under density of planets kind of in the center of this diagram. And this is the planet radius valley, which separates the super earths down here from the sub Neptunes up above. And because of this relationship between incident flux and stellar mass, this will then lead us to ask the question, well, how does the planet radius valley actually depend on stellar mass for these um, roughly FGK stars? So here we've got planet radius on the y-axis, and now we plot it directly against stellar mass. And now I want to kind of go through each of the points on this diagram. So these are the individual planet radius um, stellar mass pairs. And underneath, we've got a two-dimensional kernel density estimate distribution where darker colors indicate higher relative densities of planets. And what I really want to focus on in this plot is a central region of the diagram, which shows in red our best fit solution to the planet radius valley. So along this line, we essentially minimize the densities of points or maximize the depth of the gap. Um, and this blue shaded region indicates our relative uncertainty in the determination of that best fit line. Now, how do the, the different um, theories of core powered mass loss and photo evaporation actually compare on this plot? Well, um, as, as Ryan pointed out before, um, it turns out that photo evaporation actually requires a planet stellar mass dependence to show a slope on this plot. And it turns out that these slopes here are different levels of planet stellar mass dependences. So how strong is that? Um, and these are the black dotted and dashed lines that you see here, whereas core powered mass loss predicts a slope somewhere in between those two lines. Now, given the uncertainty region that we see here, I think we can ultimately say that it is currently not possible to differentiate between these two theories in this particular area of parameter space. And it turns out that to do so, you would need something like 20,000 planets with 1% fractional precisions on planet radius and stellar mass. So then this leads to the question, OK, well, we've looked at stellar mass. How about stellar age? So here we've got our number of planets, or um, not, not occurrence rate, on the y-axis. Um, versus planet radius on the x-axis here. Each of these ticks are the individual planet radii um, as a part of the old planet radius distribution, which are planets that are older than one year that we've determined from our um, host star sample. Um, and what we're really interested in in this plot is the relative number of super-Earths and sub-Neptunes. Now, super-Earths are any planet that we define as being between 1 and about 1.8 or so Earth radii. And sub-Neptunes are any planet that is between 1.8 and about 3.5 or so Earth radii. These are based on the definitions from Fulton et al. 2017. But if we actually end up doing a computation of counting up the number of super-Earths that are between those values and sub-Neptunes the same, and then do some Monte Carlo simulations to determine, um, for instance, how uncertain those values are, we end up with a ratio that is 1 plus or minus 0.1. Now, this value is a little bit meaningless at this point in time until we actually compare it to what the young planet distribution looks like, or planets that are younger than one giga year. And immediately as I put this plot up, you'll notice that there appear to be some pretty big differences. Number one, um, that the uh, super Earth's peak is much lower in the young planet distribution. And then in addition, the sub Neptune peak is considerably wider than what we see in the old planet distribution. And if we do a similar um, comparison and computation as what we did for the old planet distribution, we end up with a ratio of 0.61 plus or minus 0 0.09. Now, what does this say? Well, it suggests that sub-Neptunes are becoming super-Earths on roughly giga-year timescales. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a little bit of a difference between the theories of core powered mass loss and photo evaporation and what exactly they expect um, for the timescales for this planet um, atmosphere loss to be. Um, however, um, so, so originally we thought, oh, well, giga year timescales would match up well with core powered mass loss. However, some recent work by James Rogers and James Owen has shown that photo evaporation can also produce 
this sort of a diagram on roughly giga year time scales. So at least in terms of exactly which theory is going to describe what's happening here, I think that's still to be determined um, as we get more precise stellar ages, for instance. Um, but I think overall, what we can um, conclude is that these sub-Neptunes are becoming super-Earths on these roughly giga year time scales. I think this is the first time that we've really seen um, true observational evidence of this. Um, so with that, um, I will leave up my summary and conclusion slide. Thank you for your time. And are there any questions? Hey, thank you very much, Travis, for your wonderful talk. So let's start with some questions. So let me see. Are actually your results suggesting an evolutionary implication from subneptons to super Earth? Um, so our, our, our results, I think, are showing that um, because largely what we're seeing is when we actually compare the differences in the age distributions, we've checked to make sure that things such as stellar mass, um, stellar metallicity, um, and stellar radii between the, both the um, old and young host distributions are roughly the same. We've been very careful in making sure that the distributions are matched as much as possible and that this couldn't potentially be something as a part of um, other, uh, like for instance, um, uh, detection uh, biases and that sort of stuff. Thank you. Let's have one more question from Eric Ford. Could part of the difference super Earth ratio for young and old stars be due to the fact that young stars tend to be more massive stars? Can you say how much? Yeah, so um, the, young, the young stars that we are that we are um, getting here, they are slightly more massive than the old stars. Um, the thing is, it's very, very hard to actually separate those two factors, um, especially when you're using isochrone ages. But to just kind of give you an idea of where the stars occur on the HR diagram, I've got an extra slide here, which shows the comparison of the stars that are roughly younger than one gig year and roughly um, older than one gig year. And so the purple and green points match up to the purple and green distributions that you saw on the previous slide. Um, and so what you can see here is that um, we've tried to match the samples as well as possible, but there, there are very slight differences in, um, in stellar mass between the young and old um, samples. Okay, thank you very much. All the other uh, um, questions are going to be in the Slack channel. So let's move to the next speaker. Thank you, Travis. Uh, our last speaker of this session is Andrew Neal from the University of Chicago presenting Joint Mass Radius Period Distribution Modeling of Water Works. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. So today I'll be talking about my work on the joint mass radius period distribution modeling of water worlds. And this is work I couldn't have done without my collaborators, Jessica Liston, a former undergrad at Columbia University, and my advisor, Professor Leslie Rogers at UChicago. So we've heard plenty, and I think we're all familiar with the radius gap. And uh, photo evaporation seems to be the favorite or default uh, explanation, but certainly as we've seen in the past few talks, there are several competing theories. The theory we want to focus on in this work is the existence of water worlds. So alongside a population of rocky planets, we have a population of uh, water rich, low dense uh, icy planets. And these two populations can together uh, recreate the radius gap. And this is something that has been um, proposed by Zeng et al 2019, for instance, a plot of which I'm showing here, among others. So the science question we're trying to address is to what extent is photo evaporation necessary or um, is this water world idea equally valid? And um, what's the level of support between these two theories in the current data set? So taking a step back, when we talk about constraining planet occurrence rates, we typically think in two dimensions. So for a transit survey like Kepler, we think about uh, the radius period occurrence rates. Uh, we also think about mass period space. When we're talking about radio velocity surveys. 
And then we can also talk about the mass radius space, uh, which we usually think about in terms of the mass radius relationship, an example of which I'm showing on the right. However, we have all the necessary ingredients to begin to constrain the joint 3D distribution in mass radius and period by combining a transit survey like Kepler with mass measurements on uh, transiting planets where available. So to take a look uh, a bit further detail at what that means in terms of the math, we start with the uh, planet occurrence rate density as a function of period, mass, and radius. And then we can break that down several ways. Here's an example. Um, so we start off with the normalization constant, the number of planets per star in our region of parameter space. And then we have three different distributions. We have the period distribution here, uh, independent of mass and radius. And uh, we typically parameterize this in our models with a broken power law. Next, we have a mass distribution, which we typically parameterize in our models with a log normal. And then finally, this last one is the radius condition on mass uh, distribution, which we usually implement using a mass radius relation. And this varies depending on what composition of planet we're talking about. Now, the great thing about this formulation is that we can easily incorporate multiple populations of planets using a mixture model. So let's take a look at what that uh, looks like. So we take the equation from the previous slide and we simply add in these mixture fractions denoted by Q. And this mixture fraction can depend on period, mass, and radius. For example, if you're um, implementing photo evaporation, which we do in our models. And then each population can have its own period, mass, and uh, radius distribution, which can emulate different uh, formation histories and different compositions. Uh, and that's uh, why these are denoted by, why these are conditional on Q. So using this breakdown, along with uh, hierarchical Bayesian modeling, choosing the parameterizations of all these distributions and MCMC, uh, we, create, we created several models. We, fitted those, we fit those to the uh, CKS data sets. And this was the main focus of our 2020 paper, uh, Neil and Rogers 2020. So uh, the model I'm presenting here has three different populations of planets. There's uh, planets with gaseous envelopes in blue, evaporated rocky cores in red, and intrinsically rocky planets that formed without any gas in green. So it's hard to visualize in 3D. So typically you just, uh, you can do all the same sorts of 2D and 1D projections that we're used to. So in this example plot, we have the 1D mass distribution in the top, the 1D period distributions in the upper right, and the 1D radius distributions on the right, um, broken down into the three populations with the data shown in black. And then in the lower left, we're showing the mass radius space where the planets with gaseous compositions follow a different mass radius relationship than the planets with rocky compositions. So in this paper, we created several different models of different numbers of populations. And then we uh, did several different analyses. For example, we calculated occurrence rates, which showed that uh, the occurrence rates estimates you uh, get in different regions of parameter space are heavily model dependent. So if you use one model with one, a single population of planets, you'll get a much different answer from a model with three populations. We also predicted masses of planets for planets without mass measurements. And we use model selection to show that actually uh, there seems to be support in the data set for including these three populations rather than having a single population of planets. However, our most recent work has been focused on the question I brought up at the beginning, which is how do water worlds fit into this picture? So in this model, we're, we're invoking uh, photo evaporation. But what does this picture look like if we include planets with uh, icy compositions? So this model has three populations differentiated by um, their formation. Uh, we created a whole slew of models that also differentiate in a different dimension, which is composition. So we have uh, planets with gaseous uh, envelopes planets that had gaseous envelopes but lost them, and then planets that formed without them. So that's one dimension. And the second dimension is, is the planet core a rocky composition or an icy composition. So in total, this gives you the six populations you, you see on the left. And then uh, we combine these different populations and different combinations to get all the models you see here. Uh, so these columns denote how many populations are in each of these models. 
the top row shows the three models we presented in Neil and Rogers 2020. And the bottom row are all the new models that incorporate water world in various ways. A particular interest is this uh, model Z, which does not have any, um, does not invoke photo evaporation at all. So that's the, really the test of, um, can we explain the data without invoking photo evaporation and just including both planets with rocky compositions and planets with icy compositions. As you go to the right, uh, you build more and more complex models with more and more populations, eventually reaching the ultimate model with all six of them. So with this uh, zoo of models in tow, there are a lot of interesting plots and analyses to look at. I'll just show an example. So for this most complex model with six populations of planets, um, not all of those populations have equal support. So here I'm showing the relative fraction uh, and the underlying uh, planet population that belong to each different mixture uh, with the error bar shown in black. So we can see that some populations uh, have a high fraction, for instance, the gaseous planets with a rocky core, whereas some populations are consistent with zero. For instance, here, the um, gaseous planets with icy cores. And of course, this is all dependent on the choice of parameterization and um, our assumptions. But uh, with these results, we wanted to also assess, so we have this model with six populations, to what extent are we justified in including all these populations? And um, would a model with one or two or three populations perform just as well as this very complex model? So to assess that, we turn to something called, uh, we use a model selection technique called cross-validation. So basically we split the data set up into 10 different subsets. And then for each model, we fit it 10 different times, each time excluding a different subset. And then uh, what this does is this, this allows us to assess how each model will perform uh, when it is exposed to new data. So it, uh, when you give it data, new data it hasn't seen, how well is it able to predict uh, that data's properties? So this plot, uh, is showing for each of the 10 models we have, how well the model in question performs compared to the standard model, which has the three populations of rocky planets that I showed a few slides ago. Uh, so higher numbers indicate that the model in question performs better than that uh, model three, whereas negative numbers means it performs worse. And the main takeaway from this plot is once you reach a certain level of complexity, so once you go beyond one or two populations of planets, uh, all of these more complex models, while some of them may perform slightly better or slightly worse, they all seem to uh, broadly uh, have the same level of support. So uh, simulations we performed have backed this up and have shown that uh, with the current data set that we have, um, it's very difficult to distinguish between models with six populations of planets with different compositions and different formation versus more simpler models. And to really be able to distinguish between these different models, we need a higher quality data set, like something that may come out of a mission like uh, Plato with uh, more planets, more mass measurements and uh, lower uncertainties on those mass measurements. So uh, to conclude, what we've done is we've modeled the joint mass radius period distribution uh, and incorporated uh, multiple populations of planets in those models, including both uh, those with different formation and with different compositions. The current data set that we use is consistent with several of these more complex models, including both those with or without photo evaporation and with or without water worlds. And so to really distinguish between the models that we presented here, uh, we need a higher quality uh, data set, such as one that might come out in the future from a mission like Plato. Thank you, I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Let's move to the Q&A window. The first is from Octavio Aguilera. He says, nice talk. Which is the composition of the envelope of the ice-rich planet? So I think we, we didn't distinguish between the composition of the uh, 
rocky planets versus the icy planets in terms of their gaseous envelopes. Um, they both follow the same uh, formulation. But that's something okay. that can be explained. Okay, thanks. And now Lauren Weiss says, Andrew, how did you select the data to put on your mass radius diagram? There are far more planets with mass constraints than what you are showing. Yeah, so uh, first of all, that, that data set is probably a year or two old by now. And also, as you may have noticed, we didn't include TTP planets. That's something we've always uh, wanted to push forward with, uh, but haven't done so yet. But that can certainly change the, the picture because there are a lot of planets with TTP mass measurements that could help this, uh, distinguish between these different models. Okay, the next question, William Misoner. What is the difference in your models between evaporated rocky planets and intrinsically rocky ones? So evaporated rocky planets, uh, we assume to have formed with a gaseous envelope. And then depending on the planet's uh, period and mass, as well as, as its uh, host star parameters, um, we uh, implement a photo evaporation prescription. Uh, whereas the intrinsically rocky planets, they're just assumed to have a rocky composition. And uh, those two different populations also have distinct period distributions and mass distributions, which are uh, um, retrieved by the, the model fit to the data. Okay, thank you. And the last question is from James Owen. Uh, do these scenarios predict very different mass functions? Um, yeah, so we did parameterize them all at the log normal distribution, but um, with these different populations, they can have wildly different uh, retrieve parameters in that log normal distribution. Some have very low masses, some have very high masses, some with uh, large scatter, some with small scatter. So there's a lot of variation uh, in terms of the mass distributions. Okay, so thank you very much, Andrew. Okay, it looks like we've covered the main items for this session. I would like to thank you all the speakers for the wonderful talk today. Thank you all for attending and stay tuned. We came back in almost 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simona. Okay, so lots of the speakers in this session, I think all of them have questions in the Slack. Go over to the Slack and keep the discussion going. Don't forget to check out the posters that go with this session. They're posted on the website, they're in the Slack. Uh, I've emailed out today's issue of our, of our daily e-zine. Hopefully you only get it once. <laughs> um, if you didn't get it, look for it in the Slack. Uh, and finally, as Simona said, please come back in just under half an hour. We're going to transition from small planets to giant planets. Thanks, everyone. Have a good break. Head to Wonder and chat to people.
Nailed it. Cool. Just had it. There we go. Cool.
don't want me to fucking change it. Oh, God. This is so fucking annoying. God damn it. Sam, so I think you're unmuted. And I don't think they mean to be. Thanks, Sam. Sorry very much. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, just a reminder to uh, to make sure your microphone's muted unless you are unless you're talking. Uh, so thanks to both the organisers and the speakers. It's been really a great meeting so far. So we now move on to the session on giant planets and, and brown dwarfs. So the first part of this session will begin with a review talk, followed by three contributed talks and ending with ten poster pops. A reminder that the conference is being recorded. So my name is David Anderson. I'm at the University of Warwick in the UK. And within the WASP and now NGTS transit surveys, I work on the discovery and characterization of transiting planets and brown dwarfs. So I'll be the chair for the first part of this session. A reminder to ask questions during the talks using the Q&A tool within Zoom. There is the option to ask questions anonymously if you prefer. And you can also upvote questions and give your own responses there. Any unanswered questions due to limits of time, we'll move over to the meeting Slack workspace. So the first talk will be given by Daniel Thorngren uh, from the University of Montreal. Daniel, Daniel will talk to us about giant planet population physics. Take it away, Daniel. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself while I was sharing the screen. Okay, there we go. Hi. Uh, yes, I am Daniel Thorngren. I'm a Trottier postdoc uh, with IREX at the University of Montreal. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to be going over different ways you can use this uh, wonderful set of giant planets that uh, have been discovered to try to understand their physics better. Um, and the ways that ties into a whole variety of um, giant planet uh, fields. So uh, here's the data set that I was referring to. Um, <clears throat> it is the set of giant planets which have well-determined masses and radii, uh, and I've colored them by the incident flux. So that's just how much light is hitting their surface. Uh, and I've also put Uranus, Neptune, Jupiter, and Saturn on there for reference. Um, <clears throat> and you can see we're looking at, you know, by my count, about two orders of magnitude in mass, um, and about a factor of four in, in radius. Um, and so the, the first natural thing that you want to do with this data set is, is try and find mass radius relationships. And uh, so I've highlighted a couple of uh, prominent examples of that. Um, and we've actually already talked about this today to some extent, so I won't dwell on them too much. I also threw in my one citation research note, so um, <clears throat> you can check that out if you need a mass radius relation for cool giant planets. Um, but one of the things about giant planets is that it's not just uh, the mass or that determines the radius. So uh, there's this wonderful paper that Lauren Weiss did uh, in 2013 that really shows very clearly that there is a strong effect among the giant planets um, <clears throat> of the incident flux on the radius of the planet. And it's not... Uh, apparent that it's the period that matters. It, it really is the, the amount of light hitting the surface. Um, and so if you want to describe the causes of uh, <clears throat> pod Jupiter's or of a giant planet's radius, you need to also know the incident flux. Um, and so if we plot the, the giant planet radii against flux, and now we color for mass, so this is sort of a <laughs> color x axis transpose of that plot I showed you before, um, you can see that there's two regimes here. You've got the giant planets that are below about 2 times 10 to the 8 urge per second centimeter squared. That works out to an equilibrium temperature uh, under full redistribution of about 1,000 Kelvin. Um, <clears throat> below those, it doesn't seem to matter too much what the flux is. It looks like the mass is primarily what determines the radius. Uh, so you've got the lower mass stuff has smaller radii and the higher mass stuff has larger radii. But once you get past 1,000 Kelvin, 
um, you get into the hot Jupiter regime. Oops. And um, in that regime, first of all, you get much larger planets than you get normally uh, among, the, among the cool giant planets. Um, and the radii are very strongly correlated with the incident flux. Now, the mass still matters, of course. If you've got low mass planets, they still tend to be smaller. These are like sub-Saturns, roughly. But um, <clears throat> the flux ends up being the dominant variable in determining their radius. And so if you, if you want to understand their radii, you need to incorporate that information as well. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to talk about is using uh, structure evolution models to try and understand uh, the radii of these giant planets um, in a way that includes their mass, but also composition and, and flux information and, and try to piece together what we can about their giant planet interiors, which is what is where the radius comes from. Um, <clears throat> so the way giant planets, um, giant planet evolution models work is you have a static model, um, which is just a system of differential equations. You've got um, hydrostatic equilibrium, the definition of density, really, uh, and then an appropriate equation of state, which might change depending upon where you are on the planet. Um, and if you solve those uh, for a given entropy, uh, you get a radius of a planet. And then you can evolve that through time by considering how energy is entering or leaving the planet. Now, leaving the energy leaving the planet is pretty straightforward. It's just cooling over time. Uh, the energy coming into the planet, uh, wouldn't used to think that there was much of that. Uh, but then we saw hot Jupiters, and it became pretty clear that there, there probably is uh, energy uh, being pushed into the planet. But we don't totally understand the physical mechanism. But it seems to be related to the incident flux. So the way I parameterize it is just some un, you know, coefficient that we, we need to figure out times the incident flux is what's going into the planet. Um, and so the important thing to note about this kind of model is that there's two free variables here. Everything else is either part of the integration or is observable, like the, the planet's mass or the planet's radius. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to match the radius, you've got to think about what, what composition and what anomalous heating uh, should each planet have. Uh, now that's tricky because that's two variables and we're trying to explain the radius, which is one variable. Um, but if you restrict yourself to the cool giant planets, then you don't have to worry about the anomalous heating because they're just perfectly explainable radii. Um, and in that case, we have one, um, just one free variable, which is the composition that we can tune up and down to match the radius of the planet. Um, and so this is the same models that we've been using for many years on the solar system giant planets. Um, the solar system giant planet models tend to involve more information um, <clears throat> because we can actually send probes there and get gravity moments and uh, entry probes to get the uh, surface compositions. But uh, with giant planets, what we do have is a lot of them. Um, and so although we can't narrow down um, <clears throat> the compositions as well as we can for solar system planets, uh, we can get uh, a range of plausible compositions and just plot them all up together. And uh, we did this in a paper in 2016 and found that the um, composition of the planet, just the, which we treated as the bulk metallicity, uh, where metal is just everything but hydrogen and helium, if you're not familiar with that trope. Um, what we found was that the total amount of metals in the planet increases with mass. Uh, but as an absolute fraction of the mass, it's actually declining. So uh, the metal mass increases, but the gas mass in increases even faster. Um, so uh, this has a variety of useful applications. For one thing, you can you can compare uh, atmosphere models uh, that have some variable that refers to the uh, metallicity of the atmosphere uh, with the bulk metallicity. And I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, another thing you can do that, that uh, Nestor Espinoza did uh, in 2017 was uh, work out that uh, if you assume that, that uh, the planet formed at a particular location in the disk, um, and you know the bulk metallicity approximately, you can work out um, whether how much of that came from solid accretion versus gaseous accretion. 
Um, and each of those two uh, modes of, of accreting material come with different C to O ratios. Uh, and so you can work out what C to O ratio is implied by the bulk metallicity if you assume a particular location in the disk and some uh, not super strenuous assumptions about um, the disk chemistry. Um, <clears throat> so you can also compare the bulk metallicity to the parent star metallicities. And I would talk about that, but Johanna Teske is actually going to be giving a talk on this later. So you should check that out uh, Thursday at 8 a.m. Um, you might be surprised by some of our results. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is go back to the hot Jupiters. Um, and so for these guys, uh, we're talking about the uh, relatively large giant planets that are above 1,000 Kelvin equilibrium temperature, and they seem to be strongly correlated in radius with, uh, with that incident uh, flux or equilibrium temperature, however you want to look at it. Um, and this has been sort of a bugbear for theorists for quite a long time, uh, trying to work out why it is that these giant planets are so darn big. Um, and at this point, we're, we're at the situation where we have quite a lot of proposed theories, but we don't have uh, an especially good idea of which ones of them are right or not. And so what I've been trying to focus on is, is pare down some of these theories and see, see what matches up with the observations, or at least give them better targets uh, for, for their uh, uh, fitting. Um, so remember that uh, now that we're in hot Jupiters, we, we have to worry about this um, anomalous heating. Uh, and so we're back up to two free variables and only the radius. But we have a lot more planets now. Um, and so what we can do is treat this under a, a hierarchical Bayesian model um, where, OK, the mass and the radius are easy. They just have to correspond to their observed masses and radii. The age uh, is a little approximate, but it turns out it doesn't matter too much, um, corresponds to its observed age. Um, and then the metallicity, which is one of our free variables, uh, should just follow roughly the distribution that we saw in the cool giant planets. And these aren't in wildly different orbits. For the most part, our cool giant planets are still pretty warm. So uh, that's, that's a pretty plausible assumption. Um, <clears throat> That doesn't mean that every hot giant planet has to have exactly the predicted amount of metal, just that they have to, on average, have that much metal. Um, and then what we're interested in is trying to work out what um, amount of heating as, as a function of flux can reproduce the radii that we observe. Uh, so we tried a few different models of this. Um, and long story short, what we found was that the best fit was um, a model in which the uh, anomalous heating as a fraction of the incident flux uh, actually decreases at high flux. So there's some efficiency that reaches a um, peak at, at somewhere around 1600 Kelvin. Um, and that is where about two and a half percent, plus or minus half percent, one percent, somewhere in there, um, is being just injected directly into the planet through some heating mechanism. Um, and that's actually pretty interesting because uh, not all of our uh, hot Jupiter heating models predict that. Um, and so if you want to see what that looks like from a predicting the radii sense, we have uh, the expected radius for uh, a hot Jupiter um, given its mass and given, it, given its equilibrium temperature. Uh, and the points in the lines are on the same scale. So the fact that they kind of blend into the points is good because it means that our, our theory is predicting the actual radii we see. Um, and so this pattern where high incident fluxes um, end up having being less efficient at putting heat into the interior has actually been predicted before um, by Kristen Minot and um, Constantine Batigan and, and also uh, Ginsburg, uh, who is here, I believe. And um, essentially, this is because uh, for, for, sorry, this is for the Olmec dissipation model. 
Um, and this is because the magnetic interactions uh, between the upper atmosphere and the sort of deep atmosphere are what is allowing energy to get pumped down. But if you go to too high of a flux, the uh, ionization fraction gets too high in the atmosphere and uh, you end up breaking the winds that are required to send energy down. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that. That's not really, uh, uh, we don't have time. Um, it doesn't seem to match the thermal tides model, which seems to just go up and is generally too steep. Now, uh, interestingly, recently, uh, Paula Sarkis did a study on giant uh, hot Jupiters, uh, which, among other things, uh, reproduced this general shape of our um, heating, although uh, she found a higher equilibrium temperature where the peak is, so more around 2,000 Kelvin. Um, we still haven't figured out. I, I don't know what the cause for the discrepancy is. It could just be that she's got more planets now, and so we can narrow it down better. But um, still sort of a, a topic of interest. Uh, now, this, this is all important for reasons other than just purely uh, theoretical. Um, one thing is that if, uh, if you're pumping heat constantly into the planet, that heat is constantly leaking out. It's like you're building a sandcastle while the tide is coming in, and you just keep throwing more sand on it. Um, and that results in some pretty vigorous convection that produces some fairly strong magnetic fields. And so Rakesh Yadav um, just plugged in my uh, uh, heating uh, quantities uh, into the Christensen et al. Um, relationships that, that related uh, the energy coming out through a convective layer to the, um, to the strength of the magnetic fields. And so we got some fairly strong magnetic field predictions for hot Jupiters. And then interestingly, um, more recently, there have been some observations of the interactions between the star and the planet magnetic fields that suggest that these magnetic fields of the hot Jupiters are indeed pretty strong. Um, and as you can see, we're not exactly drowning in large amounts of data, and this point doesn't seem to be consistent, but uh, it does seem like hot Jupiters do have large magnetic fields. Um, let's see. So uh, a few other things that you can do with this. The, um, the large amount of energy coming out of the interior also affects the atmosphere. So, um, for example, as, as Jonathan discusses in this paper, um, that can lead to essentially not cold trapping species that had previously thought to be cold trapped. And I, I just don't have time to go into the atmosphere of that. But it, but it means that um, the atmospheric composition could be different than if you apply the usual intrinsic temperatures that we would associate with giant planets from having observed Jupiter and, and Saturn. Um, another thing is that it pushes the radiative convective boundary much, much higher in the atmosphere, which actually makes doing GCMs a little bit easier because they tend to start sometime just below the uh, radiative convective boundary. Um, all right, so I'm gonna keep moving along here. Um, another question that you can look at, uh, thanks to these big populations of uh, hot Jupiters that we've discovered, is how they evolve over time. Um, and just like with stars, we can't, you know, watch a hot Jupiter evolve, but we can see hot Jupiters at different stages of their evolution. Um, and so this was uh, following an idea that Eric Lopez came up with in 2016 uh, and has been aggressively pursuing since. Uh, which is that depending upon the underlying cause of hot Jupiter inflation, um, when the parent star goes off of the main sequence um, and therefore brightens substantially, uh, you could either have the hot Jupiter react to that increase in flux by increasing in radius, because we know that those two uh, quantities are correlated, or it could get stuck behind because it's not able to, um, well, it's not able to reinflate. And, and that's actually a very plausible thing. It, it could well be that the heat is not being deposited deep enough to actually reinflate the deep interior. Um, so they, uh, Sam Grunblatt and Eric Lopez went and found three red giants uh, that have giant planets around them, uh, hot giant planets. 
And it looks like they've been reinflating, but it's a little hard to tell, just, you know, small sample size. And uh, the planets were probably hot before the star evolved. Now they're just hotter. Um, so I wouldn't say it's uh, definitive, but it looks like they're reinflating. Um, and then a, a different approach uh, was proposed by Hartman in, in 2016, in which he observed that if you look at the fractional age of parent stars, um, that is to say they're the amount of time they spent on the main sequence uh, divided by their total main sequence lifetime. It seems like that correlates with their, um, the radius of their giant planets. So uh, what that means is that, um, well, these stars brighten over the course of the main sequence. And so maybe as they brighten, the hot Jupiters are also enlarging, uh, which would suggest that, again, reinflation occurs. So we wanted to look in detail at this. So we teamed up with Travis Berger and, and Daniel Huber. Uh, and Travis Berger gave his talk uh, recently. So if you haven't seen it, you, you should uh, go back and watch the recording. Um, but uh, they got us some really excellent stellar ages um, <clears throat> for the parent stars of hot Jupiters. And uh, we have been analyzing those in tremendous detail. Um, now, I just don't, don't have time to talk about this table, but uh, you just let me know and I will happily talk your ear off about this. Um, <clears throat> but the takeaway here is that um, we found a relationship between the mass and the flux uh, and the radius that seems to apply both to stars that have brightened significantly since they entered the main sequence, but also to stars that have not brightened. And it, it seems to be just about the same relationship which suggests that the giant planets are not falling behind because otherwise the flux would matter less for uh, stars that had brightened significantly because the star would be outrunning the planet's ability to reinflate. Um, so here's what this looks like over time. We've got the stellar luminosity on the top here and then the resulting possible tracks for the planet's radius. And so um, you can see if you just take the flux and plug it into that equation we got, you get this gray line here. And depending upon how quickly the uh, giant planet is able to uh, keep up with this reinflation, we, the deflation is easy, so we just assume it's fast. Um, <clears throat> you can either have it get stuck at some particular radius, or you can have it keep up nicely. And uh, the result is, over the star's lifetime, a significant amount of radius uh, enlargement. Um, and so we looked at, does this happen? And so if you look at the raw radius, we can get that Hartman relationship where there is a slight upward trend with the fractional age. Um, it's not very strong, but it is very statistically significant. Um, and then interestingly, we saw a downward trend with age and radius. But the tricky part about that is that that could be correlations with other things like, for example, the young stars are also the brightest. Um, so we, we compared the radius to the equilibrium radius. That's the radius defined by that mass flux relationship we had. Uh, and we see that that completely erases the Hartman et al. relationship. This is it's a, just flat. Um, if the planets weren't able to keep up, this should be a negative relationship. So it, it suggests, again, uh, hot Jupiters are able to reinflate. Um, but interestingly, and rather unexpectedly for us, uh, we, we still found that there is a decrease in um, the radius in the first few giga years of a hot Jupiter's lifetime. So we think that that is a small amount of delayed cooling uh, taking place on, um, in, the, in the very early stages of a hot Jupiter's lifetime. Uh, it's not enough to explain why hot Jupiters are so big, but it's probably a factor. Um, so I have actually already said all of this stuff, sorry. Um, so yeah, what this means is that hot Jupiters, they really do seem to reinflate pretty quickly. Uh, that can only happen, if you look at Tad Kamasik's paper, if there is heating in the very deep interior. Um, and that's kind of hard to do. So that really pairs down uh, possible reasons why hot Jupiters are so big. Um, it also seems like they cool pretty slowly. Um, and this isn't something that you don't generally get both of these effects in the same model. So it's probable that we have more than one um, of these hot Jupiter reinflation models uh, combined to create this uh, 
hot Jupiter radius inflation effect. One that deposits heat deep into the interior and another that slows down the cooling. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly talk about uh, how you can connect interior modeling to atmosphere models, just really quick. The basic idea is um, if you have a bulk composition, that is uh, an upper limit on the atmospheric composition. And the reason is that you can't have more metals on the outside of the planet because that's unstable. It'll all convect downwards in a beautiful fluid dynamical mass. Uh, you can definitely have more metals in the middle, but you can't have it on the outside of the planet. Um, and so if you want to have the most atmospheric metal possible, you just fully mix your planet. Um, and so I made a hierarchical Bayesian model. It's very, very similar to the last one. Uh, and you can apply it to giant planets um, and get a bulk metallicity and therefore an upper limit on the metallicity for an atmosphere model. And you can use that to constrain your... Um, your atmospheric observations, uh, which might include metallicity as a parameter. All right, so here's my conclusions. I have uh, already said all of these, so I'll just go straight to questions. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Daniel. So the, the first question comes from Eve Lee. Could you explain a bit more about the expected, expected magnetic field intensity of hot Jupiter's versus radius. In particular, why do the expected values show large scatter for radii of less than 1.4 Jupiter and pretty much constant for larger radii? Am I back? I'm back, okay. Sorry. Uh, Sorry, Daniel, did you miss the question? Yes, I did. Sorry, my, my laptop yeah, no problem. Out. The first question from Eve Lee. Uh, could you explain a bit more about the expected magnetic field intensity of hot Jupiters as a function of radius? In particular, why do the expected values show large scatter for radii smaller than 1.4 times the, the radius of Jupiter? And there, it's pretty much constant for larger radii. Um, well, part of it is that I think uh, for reason you get a decrease in scatter here is just that um, when you get to the really large Jupiters, uh, you get there by having not very much metal in them and a lot of heating. And that kind of gets you into sort of a corner of parameter space. Um, I'm not sure that we've actually pinned down all the modeling uncertainties in this. I think you should consider this to be more of a, like we didn't show error bars because we don't really quite know what the error bars are on these. Um, the takeaway from this should be that the magnetic fields are strong, not that the magnetic field of this particular planet is exactly 200 Gauss. Um, and let's see, I, that was the second half of the question. The first half of the question, I, I suppose the answer would be, this is like, we're just literally using relationships uh, from the Christensen et al paper that uh, relates uh, the intrinsic temperature of a, uh, convective object to its magnetic field. And we think that that's the dominant source of magnetism for these guys. Okay, thanks. Uh, so then a question by Ben Linsmeyer. Does this inflation model over time correspond with any evidence of historical inflation of our solar system's Jupiter? Um, so Certainly, um, this all starts, like giant planets start their lives very hot. Um, and so early in their lifetime, they're very large. Uh, we don't really know how big though. It's kind of hard to work out. We got the hot start versus cold start problem, which is literally just that uh, the fine details of their formation determines their initial internal heating or internal heat. Uh, so we don't quite know where to start them out, but uh, certainly my models are all consistent with the idea that young Jupiter was quite large. Um, but this is a, that would be for different reasons. Um, that, that, that's because of formation heat rather than uh, the things heating the hot Jupiters, which seem to only take place above a thousand Kelvin equilibrium temperature. Sure. Uh, so next question from Neda Haimpo. Uh, can, you, can your metallicity model on the last slide explain the high metallicity of Jupiter's envelope? 
Uh, yeah, I, I cut the slide because I have way too many slides, but um, the, uh, there are certainly uh, some modeling uncertainties that are not included in this just because of the statistical uncertainties. But uh, if, I, if I plug in Jupiter's values and, um, and just, you know, plug and chug as if it were a, an exoplanet, I do, I do get an upper limit for atmospheric metallicity that is larger than the, um, than the actual observed metallicity in Jupiter. Um, so yes, it, it, it seems to work for Jupiter and Saturn is the answer. So I think a, a final question from Christoph Mordesini. So the new uh, Chabriet al hydrogen helium equation of state predicts quite higher densities than the older equation of state equations of state did. Uh, did you have the time to explore the consequences of that? Yeah. Um, it seems like uh, there is some that like, certainly there's going to be some effect. If you have more dense hydrogen and helium, you end up with less metals in the planet. Um, I don't think, I, I think that effect actually sort of cancels out for the hot Jupiter studies, um, just because, you know, you're switching both the the, the sort of control model of the, the cool giant planets and the uh, studied model of the, of the hot Jupiters, um, it could mean that we end up with somewhat less metals in the cool giant planets. Uh, I've done some back of the envelope stuff and it doesn't seem like the difference is huge, but um, you still might want to sort of mentally shift that uh, mass metallicity relationship downwards a little bit. Um, but I haven't had time to do the full update. So. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Daniel. Um, any further questions, please post them into the into the Slack channel. Thanks again, Daniel. Thank you. Okay, so our next talk will come from uh, Raphael Luque. He's at the IAC or the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canaries. And Raphael will be talking to us about the obliquity distribution of ultra hot Jupiters, a population wide view. Please go ahead, Raphael. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about ultra hot Jupiters. I will not talk about the small planets from the previous section that is usually my, my topic, but I want to tell you a, a little bit about hot planets and, and obliquity measurements uh, from a project that we are doing here in Canarias. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit of rossiter McLaughlin effect that I think it is not much covered in this uh, conference. So I will spend some minutes uh, explaining a little bit more in detail what, what it is. So the rossiter McLaughlin effect is mostly the detection of a planetary transit, but using a spectroscopy. So uh, it, it appears as, as an anomalous radial velocity variation because a planet, it is blocking light from a rotating star. So this, uh, this radial velocity uh, uh, anomaly can tell us information about the planet to star radius ratio, but this we can also get from transits. Uh, the rotational speed of the star that we can get from other, uh, from other methods uh, or the impact parameter also from, from photometry, but it tell us mostly about the sky projected spin orbit angle. Uh, and this lambda parameter is something that uh, the rossiter McLaughlin uh, uh, infers and very few techniques can, can do that. And I, I'm just, I want to stress that we can only measure the sky projected uh, spin orbit angle with this technique, measure the radial velocities, because the true obliquity, this purple uh, psi angle, it is only revealed when, when there is information about the stellar spin axis. So when we actually know the rotation of the star in, the, uh, in, in a 3D uh, configuration, and we know the orbital, the, the planetary inclination, then we can infer the true obliquity. But if we don't have information about that, about the stellar spin axis, we can only see what is the sky projected uh, uh, stellar spin axis. So as seen in, this, in these examples for a planet that uh, transits the star with an impact parameter of minus 0 0.5, a radial velocity anomaly uh, known as the rossiter McLaughlin effect will make a bump to the blue part uh, to positive radial velocities because it's blocking light from the 
blue part of the star that is rotating uh, toward us and it becomes it decreases decreases until it goes to the center when we go back to the normal radial velocity due to the the, the planet orbiting the star and then as it moves to the to the right to the redder part when the star is receding from our uh, our point of view then it creates a negative bump in the radial velocity but this shape it is not necessarily all, always the same it depends on the angle that the that the planet is crossing the star as it rotates so uh, for for planets that are inclined that are almost polar with the with the rotational uh, uh, axis of the star, then we see that it only covers here the reddest part of the star, the, the parts that is receding. So the, it creates a shape that is kind of a transit in photometry, even though it is radial velocity. So the, the first rositer laughing effect measurement in an exoplanet was done by Didier Kelos in the 2000. And since there, there has been like 250 measurements in more than 150 different exoplanets. So the exoplanets of liquidities, these radial velocity measurements are very important to understand formation evolutionary uh, evolution of planetary system. And they have been mostly done for transiting hot Jupiters because they have bright hosts and they have big radial, uh, big rositer uh, uh, RM amplitudes because they rotate usually fast uh, and they have large masses. And the exoplanets after, uh, uh, with the, with the time, these measurements became more common. They exhibit a large diversity of spin orbit angles. And there are many planets that are misaligned, and there are even some that are in retrograde orbits. And, and one important uh, question, uh, one important plot, one, one of those very nice four pages paper that, that changed a, a field like the Josh Wynn paper in 2010, shows that the, this, this observational result that the planets that are orbiting hotter stars in the right part of the diagram are more often misaligned than the ones uh, that are orbiting cooler stars. And this is related with the bottom panel of the, of the plot where, where the convective zone of a star is a function of a spe stellar effective temperature. And it seems that for the stars, the hotter stars that do not have almost convective zones, the, the planets are more misaligned. So we, we think that tidal evolution and dissipation may play a role in circularizing those orbits for uh, cooler stars, but with the more observations came, it does not explain all the orbital, all the observational evidence in, in the topic. So this is where it comes our project called Fermos. Uh, Fermos stands for the Homogeneous Exoplanet Rossiter McLaughlin Obliquity Study. It is a project that we started here in the Institute uh, recently ago. Uh, uh, it is done by, by the colleagues of the Institute. Nuria Casasayat Barris, Mahmoud Osag, Enrique Payea, Monica Stangret is uh, something here we are doing at home. Uh, it has some, some different goals. Uh, the goals are increasing the number of obliquity measurements of our planets. We want to make put more points in the right side of this diagram. We want to compute the radial velocity for fast rotating stars, but this is not always very easy because the fast rotating stars that are usually the host of the hot planets are uh, the CCF mass, apart from the, the, they have very few lines, these stars, they, they, because they rotate so fast, the lines are very broad. And CCF mass usually are a poor match to, to, to this. So, and computing radial velocities is not always accurate or precise. But also another goal that is important for the project is to make an homogeneous determination for all the uh, for all the planets, obliquity estimation that is homogeneous and also a stellar characterization of the host star. And because it's a Fermos, our project, we only put hot planets in it. So we are talking about mostly ultra hot Jupiters that we also study the, the composition, the atmospheric composition with the, with the different techniques using these high resolution spectrographs that, that we are taking our observations with. So the ultra hot Jupiters uh, uh, is a new class of hot Jupiters, if you can say that, but it's just simply a division in uh, equilibrium temperature. And these ultra hot Jupiters have day side temperatures higher than 2000 Kelvins. And the main difference between the ultra hot Jupiters and the hot Jupiters are the absence of water in their atmospheres. Uh, and these targets in the last years have become the the golden target for atmospheric characterization and planets like Kel9 that is one of the most extremes. You can just take the 
periodic table and start enumerating elements and you can find that practically all of them are detected in the atmosphere molecules in a ionic form in atomic form and, and this is something that thanks to the bright host stars and the elevated temperatures, they are very rich for atmospheric uh, studies. And there are around 63 ultra hot Jupiters today, but less than 20 have obliquity estimations. Our only eight have true obliquities measured. We really know the 3D, 3D orientation of the system. And this is what we do in, in the project in Thermos. Uh, an example is was 189b, that this is one of my favorite targets. It is the brightest ultra hot Jupiter host, and it was published two years ago by Anderson and collaborators. And they, they show this plot here, they measure the obliquity of the, of the planet using Harps and Coralie radial velocities. And then we have been collecting uh, archival data and new observations of this planet with Harps and Harps North. And we combine five, uh, five uh, Rositer uh, observation, five primary transits measured with radial velocities, and combining uh, uh, our measurements, we get better precision that the, that the results that have been published for this planet using other techniques that are usually more precise, like Doppler tomography or gravity darkening, that can also measure the obliquity of the, the planet. Uh, I like to, to, to show us 189 because it looks like a transit from photometry, but we need to remember that these are radial velocities and this shape is only caused because the planet is strongly misaligned. Uh, it is in a polar orbit. And our method, it, it, this proves that our method to, to calculate radial velocities using template matching, it is a very good uh, method for this star, even though it has a, a, a DSNI of 93 kilometers per second. And however, even though our Rositer, are, are, our Rositer results are very good and very precise, uh, the signal to noise in the, in, the, in the spectrum is not enough high enough to detect any atomic or molecular features uh, in the atmosphere. And for example, I want to show here a, a family portrait of many of the targets that we have been analyzing with some uh, mostly aligned orbits, but we have many more targets that we have been studying. And also we have been studying some tough cases, uh, cases like WAS33 where, where the host shows very strong pulsation that is affecting the photometric and the spectroscopic observations. But we are employing some techniques to model the Rossiter together with the Gaussian processes and we are able combining several transits and with information a priori of the, of the period of the pulsations, we can recover the, the obliquity of, of the planet. Although also for this target with pulsation, Doppler tomography is a very good modeling uh, approach. So some of the results that uh, so far our project has, has got is that we really confirm that the observational trend that misaligned planets are orbiting generally host stars. We have measured for the first time the obliquity of a handful ultra hot Jupiters, and we have revised, uh, revisited the determination of all of them. And that we also find significant differences in the, in the estimation of this and I from the radial uh, Rossiter McLaughlin uh, modeling compared with the literature uh, using another methods. But this is a project that is still in construction. This is work in progress like the Sagrada Familia. So, our, our, some conclusions that are uh, from our project is that. We are extending the sample of hot planets with obliquity determination. This is one of the goals of Thermos and to make an homogeneous study uh, of the modeling of the gross thermal laughing effect for all ultra hot Jupiters. And by this, I mean for all is also for those that do not have measurements, we are obtaining telescope time to get new measurements and also reanalyzing archival data. And with this reanalysis, we are refining uh, ephemeris. This is the case, for example, Mascara 1. We, we improve other parameters that were not the obliquity for this planet, thanks to this reanalysis. And we, we want to extend it also to CCF and Doppler tomography techniques uh, to compare our results uh, with the normal radial velocity modeling, and then build a large observational sample to be able to test some theories about planetary mutation, orbital stability, uh, formation mechanisms. Thanks, Rafael. It's uh, some really, really nice results. Uh, the WASP-189 data is uh, mm -hmm. very impressive indeed. Uh, do we have uh, questions for, for Rafael? Okay, so a question from uh, Kevin. Uh, can you expand on how the template matching process works to improve precise 
radial velocity measurements for fast rotating stars? Yeah, so our idea here is that uh, since uh, the typical host of the ultra hot Jupiters are A or F stars, they have very few lines and they have because they are fast rotating, they are very broad. So usually there are no CCF mass. The CCF mass that has been typically been built for is for precise radial velocity observations of FJK dwarfs now or even M dwarfs now. But there are no good CCF mass for A and F stars because of the few lines. So our idea was to do a CCF with the, the, with the already uh, a spectra of the star itself. So we are actually with template matching, what we are building is a high signal to noise template about the spectra of the star itself. And then we cost correlate our measurements with the, with the star itself. So in this, in this uh, way, we have a better template than it is actually the using a CCF mass that has been pre-computed. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have further questions? Have you um, considered, at least for the for the brighter hosts, using uh, the Rosner McLaughlin reloaded technique of um, yeah, the Segler? Is, this is something that we want to we want to learn here. This is something that we are doing uh, at home. And this is something that it would be very interesting, especially for the more active targets, uh, uh, where the radial velocity signal, it is not very clear. It is dominated by stellar activity. And we think Doppler tomography or reloaded RM are the, are the best ways to, to model it. But as I, as I tell you, the idea is also to make an homogeneous study. So if we learn the reloaded RM, we would like to apply it almost to all of our targets to, to be able to compare uh, the different modeling techniques and the results with it. Sure, sounds good. Um, okay, I, I think that's time. So any more questions, um, uh, mess message Raphael and preferably in the, in the Slack so others can see the question and answers. Uh, thanks Raphael once again for, for a nice talk. And we'll move on to uh, the third talk of the session, which is by uh, Jin Dong at Penn State University. And that's on the eccentricity distribution and occurrence rates of warm, large exoplanets. Uh, take it away, DJ. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, also, I want to thank the uh, organizing committee for uh, organizing the conference and giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, my recent project. So uh, I'll be talking about the eccentricity distribution and current rates of warm large exoplanets. At the beginning, I want to give credits to my advisors and collaborators, and especially the uh, test subgroup one and two has been making great contribution on ground-based following up on the uh, test planning candidates. First, uh, when I talk about the warm large exoplanets, I'm actually referring a population of exoplanets called warm Jupiters. Since we are uh, searching for those warm Jupiters in the test data, uh, we don't have exact mass measurements on them. So it's more accurate to call them warm large exoplanets. And uh, we gave it pretty, uh, I think it's a pretty nice and creative acronym, WILS. But uh, after I first uh, announced it in the summer, I heard various voices. So uh, TOID has been one of your uh, least favorite acronyms. It's now just for the internal use. And the last thing I want to address here is like, warm Jupiters are a key missing piece in our planetary system formation and evolution theory. It has drawn much less attention compared to how Jupiters, but they are still a really uh, indispensable part of the giant planet population. And to be able to fully understand how Jupiters uh, we will also need to understand warm jitters. So um, instead, we want to study the eccentric distribution and occurrence rates of warm large exoplanets. Uh, but why it is important to learn uh, them. So first about the eccentricity distribution, uh, we have three debating uh, warm Jupiter orange channels, the in-situ formation uh, origin channel, disk migration channel, and high eccentricity tidal migration channel. 
and each of these channels have a different uh, prediction on uh, what uh, sort of eccentricities this uh, warm Jupiters will have. Uh, the in situ uh, formation tend to produce multiple uh, nearby gem planets, and this planet could have gravitational interaction between each other, like planet planet scattering, and uh, excites the warm Jupiter's eccentricities. So uh, on this lower um, lower left plot, I'm showing like a possible range of the eccentricities we could observe as a function of semi-major, uh, not semi-major axis, as a function of orbital periods. Uh, the blue strips is basically the uh, parameter space uh, warm tutors could get from the in-situ formation. And the disk migration as planets migrating inwards from a large semi-major axis to a small semi-major axis. And uh, we uh, predict this sort of uh, formation channel will have warm Jupiters, uh, will send warm Jupiters to a really uh, circular orbit. And lastly, the high eccentricity tidal migration. Uh, so planet warm Jupiters are, uh, how are cold Jupiters at large orbital periods with highly elliptical orbits and tidal dissipation in the planet uh, cause them loose energy, but meanwhile, their uh, angular momentum is conserved. So they have their orbit scrunch, scrunk, and uh, their uh, orbit is getting more and more circular. So uh, the high e migration channel is the uh, so, so far the only one of the three that could, that would predict a highly elliptical uh, warm Jupiter at a small symmetry axis. And next about the occurrence rates, um, when I'm talking about the occurrence rate, I'm more thinking of, uh, first of all, a uh, semi-major, uh, a occurrence rate as function of the orbital period. Uh, although we don't have too much uh, theoretical prediction on uh, what sort of semi-major axis distribution each of the origin channels will be produced, uh, I believe like uh, with a better observation, uh, observation will, uh, would inspire the series on, uh, on building like uh, better models. And I think a more important part on to learn warm Jupiter's occurrence rates is to link it to hot and cold Jupiters. So here I'm showing the uh, occurrence rates of the observed radio velocity uh, giant planets. So the sample is quite complete for the uh, short orbital periods range. And we see something called the radius valley, which is saying the warm Jupiters have a slightly uh, lower current risk compared to hot Jupiters. Uh, if this is true, uh, it will have really, uh, it will have strong implications on the uh, energy channels of warm Jupiters and hot Jupiters. Uh, one goal of our test study is to test the robustness of this uh, radius valley. So uh, we searched for warm larger exoplanets uh, in the test for frame images. Again, we defined this as uh, planets between 6 to 20 Earth radii and with orbital periods uh, between 8 to 200 days. And we cut our sample by test uh, band magnitude of 12. This will allow our sample to be feasible for ground-based follow-up. And uh, the planets are searched with the KLP pipeline uh, which is some awesome work done by Chelsea. And uh, we human rights those uh, shuttle crossing ones and false positives and model the light curve using the exoplanet package developed by them for Mackey. So after all this work, we identified a catalog of uh, about 70 warm large exoplanet candidates. And before uh, talking about the eccentricity distribution of our catalog, I want to um, mention a special treatment we have on the eccentricity of these targets. Uh, so we uh, have a two-step approach to uh, infer the eccentricity of each uh, planet. Um, we first derive the uh, stellar posterior uh, from the isochrome fitting, what we call low star here. And then we have a standard density posterior derived from the light curve modeling. And when we model the light curves, we assume each of them have a circular orbit. So to infer the eccentricity, uh, we compare the uh, stellar density posterior from the isochrome fitting 
and from the Lecker modeling. So uh, you see Roster posterior and Roster posterior are quite consistent with each other, which, uh, which I'm showing on the lower left plot here. It indicates the planet has a very circular orbit. And if those two posteriors are uh, highly separated, then uh, it's saying uh, this, uh, it is likely to be a warm Jupiter with a highly elliptical orbit. So this is called the uh, photoeccentric effect. And we apply this on each of the planets in our uh, catalog. So you can see a sort of uh, individual eccentricities we have for each of the targets. And uh, again, we see a wide range of eccentricities as uh, what people usually thought to be. And um, here I'm showing a, I'm colored those uh, warm Jupiters, so we are pretty sure they have high eccentricities in this orange color. And uh, what are what the warm Jupiter space orbit is consistent with a circular or a low E uh, orbit in blue. About 20% of them having high E's and about 80% uh, having low E's. But of course, this is just from like in, evaluate the eccentricity of this warm Jupiters one by one. Here, uh, I introduce our hierarchical Bayesian modeling to study the eccentricity distribution of the catalog. Uh, so we tried several function functional forms for the eccentricity distribution, including a beta distribution, a relay distribution, and here I'm presenting the mixture model we used. Basically, uh, we uh, try a mixture eccentricity distribution because uh, warm Jupiters have multiple origin channels, and some of them predict low E and moderate E uh, warm Jupiters, and some of them predicts really high eccentricity warm Jupiters. So um, our uh, hierarchical model has six hyperparameters. Uh, you can see the F1 and F2 here are presenting the uh, fractions of each of the two normal distributions we said. So mu one and sigma mu one sigma one presents the, uh, a uh, low E population, mu two and sigma two presents a high E population. And again, for each individual planet, we model its rho star eccentricity and argumental parabs. And those three values will give us an uh, rho cert, and we compare the row circle to the um, observed row circle from light curve fitting to get the likelihood. You may also notice a component what we call the uh, P transit and observed. This is a part where we take account of the transit probability and also we set a uh, maximum as interest a planet could have to avoid it getting uh, totally disrupted by its whole star. So uh, I code this whole thing use uh, the PIMC package. And here is the eccentricity distribution we find. So we see a uh, low E population centered around 0.13 and 60% of the warm Jupiters fall into this low E population. And a high E population centered around uh, 0.46 and roughly 40% of the warm Jupiters fall into this high E population. Uh, I don't want to give some uh, direct comments on what this observed eccentricity distribution means on the uh, warm Jupiter's only channels, because I do think we need to have a more detailed theoretical modeling to prepare what the uh, serial predicts to this observed eccentricity distribution. Uh, again, I want to emphasize this is an observed eccentricity distribution. Uh, most of our warm Jupiters have an orbital period between eight to 20 days. This is because the test baseline is uh, usually pretty sure either 27 or uh, 54 days. And also um, we don't have a detailed understanding uh, on each of the planets in our sample. Per particularly those are planet candidates instead of validated or confirmed planets. So next time we'll talk about our work towards the occurrence trace of warm large exoplanets. This is uh, the part of work we want to understand each of the planets in our population, whether they are false positives or a planet. Uh, so we initiated a ground-based follow-up program this summer to validate our catalog. 
uh, about uh, half of catalogs are TOIs for this part of where, uh, for this part of the catalog, we are collaborating with the test subgroup one and two on um, validating these candidates. And we also have our own program to uh, follow up those uh, candidates that are not yet identified as TOIs. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to go quickly. Uh, we have two components, a photometric follow-up part and spectroscopy follow-up part. And that's our final goal of constructing a uniform and clean catalog. Uh, here I'm just showing the photometric follow-up progress. So we are able to validating like seven warm Jupiters in the past two months. And we still have about 20 remain to be validated. And this will be my uh, summary slides. I will just leave it here. Have you to take any questions? Thank you. Nice talk. So the first question comes from uh, Ashley uh, Chantos. Do you happen to have the modeled eccentricity distribution plotted with some stellar dependence as well, i.e., the scaled stellar, um, the scale distance, scale to the stellar radius? Right, uh, that's uh, like the next uh, step of our model, like including the dependence on the same image axis and uh, also including like different uh, window, transit windows, like observation baseline we have and take account of the detection and lighting efficiency, etc. cetera. Okay. Uh, so Kevin Schlaufman asks, uh, what is the host star mass distribution of your candidates? Right, uh, so most of stars are uh, FGK stars in our sample and we don't really have like a detailed study. This will be another interesting part to be explored, yeah. Um, and I think maybe last question from Vincent Van Eylen. Do you see any trends with the ex eccentricity of warm Jupiters and the planet multiplicity? Right, um, so for our sample, we only have like three multi-planet systems. So it's quite hard to uh, draw any statistical conclusion from it. Um, but I guess like with test extent mission data or uh, with a larger sample, we could start to think of how will this uh, correlate with other, um, other planetary system parameters or stellar parameters. Um, and I'll just ask a quick final one, if I may. You said that half of your candidates are TOIs. Do you intend to make the other ones TOIs or, or do you prefer to, to follow them up? Uh, right, uh, so uh, we are sharing the list with the test subgroup ones. So I guess they will be like first CTOIs and eventually they will be boosted as TOIs. Okay, thanks again, uh, nice talk. Okay. Um, the last talk of the session before the poster pops comes from Emily Rickman at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And Emily will be talking about direct imaging and spectral characterization of long period exoplanets and brown dwarfs. Are you able to share, Emily? Oh, uh, sorry, it's giving me some problem. I'm gonna have to like quit and come back, sorry. Oh wait, hang on, oh, maybe. <laughs> oh, maybe I fixed it. Uh, can you see? Yeah. So okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, um, just, yeah. So I'm um, Emily Rickman and I'm a recent um, ESA research fellow now based at a Space Telescope. But a few months ago, I just finished up my um, PhD at the University of Geneva. And I'm going to be talking to you about um, direct imaging and spectral characterization of long period exoplanets and brown dwarfs. So we had some motivators yesterday um, from several speakers about why we look at um, these objects. Um, so first of all, we need to be able to understand the occurrence rate of long period planets and brown dwarfs, um, which is not well understood because they are and they also can be difficult to detect, but understanding their occurrence rate helps us to understand how these objects form, um, whether they form through core accretion or gravitational instability, did they form where they are today or did they migrate? And so being able to detect these objects is very important. 
Um, furthermore, looking at brown dwarf companions is really important in being able to populate the mass luminosity age relation of brown dwarfs, where we get an age estimate from the primary star, um, which is difficult to do when you're looking at field brown dwarfs. And on top of all of this, getting direct detections of brown dwarf companions and long period exoplanets allows us to test atmospheric models of um, such objects. And brown dwarfs work as great analogues towards understanding um, the atmospheres of giant exoplanets. So direct imaging over recent years has enabled um, some very interesting and exciting detections. The poster children of direct imaging that I show here, HR 8799 on the left and beta pick, have led to some really exciting results. And as, as we go forward with direct imaging, it's continuing to give us lots of exciting results. But in order to make informed observations of such targets, I had been using uh, radial velocities from the Coralie survey, which I will talk about, in order to find promising companion candidates to directly observe, to then go on and assess their detectability um, using the sphere instrument on the VLT, which I'm going to talk about. So if we look at the population of confirmed exoplanets to date, and these are taken from the NASA Exoplanet Archive, what we see here in the x-axis is the semi-major axis, which corresponds to the orbital period or the separation. And then we have the companion mass on the y-axis there. And we see that different populations of exoplanets are probed using different detection techniques, which is what we expect. So the primary um, regions that I've been looking at or interested in are these radial velocity detected planets where the um, primary um, pump of them is shown there, and then also these directly imaged candidates. And over time, naturally, as we observe the radial velocities of planets over more and more years, then we start probing these longer and longer orbital periods of exoplanets, um, which correspond to these longer and longer semi-major axes. And then simultaneously, on the other side, with direct imaging, as we go towards larger and larger telescopes, better instrumentation, and more sophisticated post-processing techniques, we're able to probe smaller and smaller inner working angles and also probe um, smaller and smaller masses of these directly imaged candidates. And so from this, we're actually able to start bridging the gap between radial velocity detected exoplanets and brown dwarfs and directly imaged candidates as well. And combining these detection techniques is really vital in being able to understand these systems and use them as benchmark objects. So the Coralie survey um, uses the Coralie spectrograph, which sits on the 1.2 meter Euler Swiss telescope in La Silla Observatory in Chile. Um, the survey has been ongoing for more than 20 years now, and it's a volume limited sample uh, within 50 parsecs of primarily solar type stars. And throughout my PhD, I was responsible for looking for long-term drifts ho hosting potential companion candidates that we could then go on to um, directly image um, using um, Sphere on the VLT. So if I take you back to this mass separation plot from before, um, I published a handful of long period exoplanets and brown dwarfs in a paper last year, and they all sit in this regime where it was really in this um, bridge that I mentioned before between radial velocity detected planets and then starting to probe those outer regions where we can start to directly image these candidates. So what I did is went on to assess the detectability of these different companion candidates that we um, detected using the Coralie survey. And for this, I converted the orbital periods from the detected radial velocities into a projected separation that we see on the x-axis there in arc seconds. And then all I've done here is I've stacked a bunch of five sigma contrast curves from measured sphere performance um, to assess whether we would actually get a, a good detection of these different candidates. So the lighter colors correspond there to um, likely to be able to observe these candidates to the darker colors correspond to whether we would get potentially a non-detection or a very faint um, detection of less than five sigma. And so of those companion candidates, one of the extremely interesting and promising ones was HD 13724. And I'd just like to emphasize again that this radial velocity data is really 20 years worth of data. So it's a huge radial velocity curve we see here. And the minimum mass that we get from the radial velocity so on the orbit of the nation is 27. So, so this sits really within the um, brown dwarf regime. And so for those of you not familiar with Sphere on the VLT, um, we can actually observe using two modes simultaneously. 
So we use both ERDIS, um, which uses narrowband photometry across the Y, J, H, and K bands, but we can also observe using IFS at the same time, which allows us to probe a range of wavelength range. So not only are we able to detect these planets um, or brown dwarfs, but also able to uh, spectrally or atmospherically characterize them at the same time. So we went on to image this companion from the Coralie survey, and we get this really nice detection here um, from the sphere data. And these ones are taken in the H band in 2018. So the two images on the left are from ADI data. And then we have um, then the detection image from SDI data on the right there. We then took follow-up data about a year later in J bands as well. And again, we see both ADI and SDI data here. Um, and the, the central white circle there just corresponds to where the primary star is and that's sitting behind the coronagraph. And then we see this nice blob and we've actually seen that it's moved over time as well. And we also have a nice detection in the K band, uh, which is a bit noisier as we expect as we extend out to those longer and longer wavelengths. So we can actually see this moving over time between about a one year period. And the really um, important thing in combining direct imaging um, observations with radial velocity observations means that we're able to fit and obtain a model independent dynamical mass because we remove the degeneracy of the unknown orb orbital inclination from the minimum mass of the radial velocity measurements alone. And so from this, we obtain a dynamical mass of about 50 Jupiter masses or so. Um, and this allows us to treat the subject as a really important benchmark object going forward. So as I said before, we can also probe the atmospheric properties of, um, of these objects. And what we see here and the gray narrow bands, these correspond to the earliest observations that I showed you of each of the images. And then we also have this IFS data range shown um, highlighted in the pink there. And we can make comparisons against atmospheric models. And here these seem to agree um, relatively well. We do have a slight excess in, in the K band and we think this might correspond to um, clouds that have, where we've used models that haven't taken this into account in this object. We also make um, comparisons against high resolution data from field brown dwarfs, which I show here from the two mass and SDSS survey. And again, we have the um, gray narrow bands corresponding to the earliest data and the pink region corresponding to the IFS data. And this, this gives us um, a fit to a brown dwarf of around a mid T type of around a thousand Kelvin or so. And so we see these atmospheric features here, these absorptions from both methane and water, which is what we would expect for a mid T type brown dwarf. And then we can also um, place this object onto a color magnitude diagram to confirm what we're seeing in terms of spectral characteristics. And then we see here as we, <clears throat> as we compare against um, several observed field brown dwarfs that we see that it agrees with being a mid T type um, brown dwarf. <clears throat> So we also have several other objects from the Coralie survey, which have been um, of great interest to us. So another such um, benchmark brown dwarf object is HD4113. This was published by Anthony Tutimatel in 2018. On the right there, we see the radial velocity curve. This is a really interesting system because it has a highly eccentric inner planet at about 500 days or so. But then we see this long-term trend, um, which was thought to correspond to a long period companion. Um, and Tutimatel, then went on to directly image this, and we see the image on the left there from also from Sphere in the H2 band um, in 2016. Um, Chita Mattel made some comparisons, again, um, similarly to how we treated 13724 um, with some models here. And what we see is that this object is extremely cool around the 500 to 600 Kelvin mark. Um, and so this is actually one of the coldest or potentially the coldest um, brown dwarf companion that's been um, detected to date. Um, and so what we see here as well is that if we look at it on the color magnitude diagram, it's way down in that um, T to Y dwarf transition, and it may even be a candidate for being a, a y, y type um, brown dwarf. And so we just have this other limit here on the, um, the color magnitude diagram because we don't get a detection in the H3 band because of the strong methane absorption of the object, which is what we expect with these ultra cool objects. So I've been following um, this brown dwarf up with um, both using Coralie. So we have updated orbital parameters from um, updated velocity data from the past few years. It's on, on the astrometric information on using the direct images on Sphere as well over the past 
few years, which we can see here. And um, again, we can actually see this um, candidate moving outwards. So I'm using this data to try and understand its um, dynamical mass better because it was not so well constrained initially and also understand whether this spectral type really sits within the wide dwarf regime or not. And just to highlight a few more um, detections that I've been looking at from the Coralie survey, but sit more in the stellar regime. So we have these radial velocity curves, again, with giant semi-amplitudes, and then we get these really nice, um, clean, direct detections of these massive um, companions, which um, probe this really, really high, either high mass brown dwarf regime or very, very low mass stars. And I'm working on um, publishing those soon. So just to wrap up, um, what I've presented here are just um, a handful of um, important ben benchmark objects, and we can use these to test atmospheric formation and evolutionary models of ultra cool substellar companions. And these are going to be really important as we go forward towards probing those smaller and smaller masses with direct imaging to use as analogues towards understanding the atmospheres of giant gaseous planets. And the detections here join just a short list of brown dwarf companions that actually have a known dynamical mass that is model independent. And we can use these to populate the mass luminosity age relation of brown dwarfs. Um, I haven't mentioned it so much here, but going forward, I plan to also combine astrometric data from Gaia and Hipparchus to um, further constrain the orbital parameters and also use this astrometric information as well as radio velocity data to um, carry out target selection to continue to find such companions and um, in the long run, test observational signatures of these um, companions to decipher different formation mechanisms. Thank you very much. Thanks, Emily. It's a great talk and a, a very nice project. I like it a lot. Uh, do we have any, any questions for Emily? Okay, so we've got one from um, Zhao Jing Zhang, sorry if I mispronounce your name, by the way. Um, for companions with dynamical masses, I'm curious about whether their spectroscopically inferred parameters are consistent or different from those based on their evolution using, for example, luminosity and mass. If different, then how much differences are there in each parameter? Yeah, so some of the companions are in good agreement. So for example, HD13724, we, it seemed to agree well with the evolutionary models, but actually we do um, have a, quite a large mass disruptancy in the case for HD4113. So for the um, dynamical mass, we measure around 60 or so Jupiter masses, but for the um, evolutionary model, so the isochronal mass estimate, it's actually around 30 Jupiter masses. And so this is part of the reason in following up the system to try and constrain um, that dynamical mass well and to see if um, if there's an issue, if there's something missing in the models or to see if there's if there's a problem elsewhere. But one such hypothesis for that um, particular system is we might be looking at an unresolved close brown dwarf binary that we're actually observing the flux of, which would take into account that factor of two um, that, that we're missing from the dynamical mass estimate. So there are cases where there are issues between the models that we're observing and the dynamical masses for sure, yeah. Mm. That's a great question. Do we have uh, any other questions? You sort of um, preempted a uh, question I had with your, your future prospects. Uh, do you have a handle already on what sort of improvements uh, you stand to, to gain from the Gaia data for the simple the systems that you've uh, presented? Yeah, so I'm not sure. I mean, it, it will yield an improvement, but I guess I'm, I'm looking at it from the other way around in that I want to use the astrometric data to make an informed decision to try and find where these companion candidates sit. Um, but definitely the long-term accelerations between um, both Guy and Hipparchus will inform that long-term orbital period, which can be vital when we're looking at such orbit, short orbital arcs from direct imaging, especially if the candidate hasn't moved that much between different epochs. Um, so that would definitely benefit. Um, so it depends somewhat on, on the like projected separation between the companion and the star and what system we're looking at. But I guess my primary case for this is to use it as a diagnostic to then go and find companions that we can directly image. Sure, okay. Thanks very much again, Anwar. Thank you. Um, Follow-up questions to the Slack channel, please, because we're, we're kind of out of time. Um, so we now have uh, 10 poster pops. So stick around for, for those videos.
Hi everyone, my name is Armin Tokajian and I am a USC graduate student working with Anthony Perot at the Carnegie Observatories on the dynamics of tides on exoplanet exomoon systems. The motivation for studying exomoons is based on a moon's significance on habitability, such as stabilizing planet obliquity and driving tidal heating. And we use two different parameterized tidal lag models, which quantitatively differ but qualitatively give the same results. An example of this is the Earth-Moon separation evolution shown here on the right, where the moon is initially pushed away but comes crashing in later on. For this paper, we studied over 1,000 single exoplanet systems, classifying them into three subcategories, rocky, neptune-like, and jupiter-like, and assessed the moon's survival times of each system. Here are the main results. These scatterplots show the moon retention time for each planet based on its composition. We conclude that there are at least 36 habitable zone planets with the potential to host an exomoon for over one giga year. These may be good targets for future follow-up observations. Everyone. My name is Stephen Carlin. I'm a PhD student in Trinity College Dublin under the supervision of Professor Alini Vidotto and my poster is on our recent letter on the dichotomy of atmospheric escape in AU MICB. So what's so special about AU MICB? Well it's a warm Neptune sized planet orbiting a nearby M dwarf star that was recently discovered. It's expected to show strong atmospheric escape due to high EUV flux from its host star while its host star is expected to have a strong stellar wind. We investigate the interaction between the escaping atmosphere and stellar wind in 3D and vary the strength of the stellar wind, investigating the effect this has on the observational signatures of atmospheric escape in Lyman Alpha. We find that as the stellar wind mass loss rate is increased, the absorption in Lyman Alpha is gradually reduced. This is because absorbing material is further confined closer to the planet for a stronger stellar wind. And as a result, observational signatures are eventually hidden for a very strong stellar wind. For more information on this, please see my poster or contact me via Slack. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Gopal Hajra and I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Trinity College Dublin. So in this poster, we have studied that how the sun-like magnetic cycle of the host star can influence the exoplanetary atmospheric escape. So basically X-ray and the extreme ultraviolet radiation which is coming from the host star plays a major role in driving the atmospheric escape in the planet. And since this XUV radiation is very well correlated with the magnetic activity of the star, it is expected that if the um, star has a magnetic cycle, that is going to change this XUV radiation. And as a result, we find that the atmospheric escape rate is also changing. So we have studied a uh, hot Jupiter system with sun as its host star, and we find that the planetary atmospheric evaporation rate is varying with the magnetic cycle. The similar conclusion also holds for other star planet system. We have studied 89733, and we find that the similar conclusion. So for more details, please visit my poster, and if you have any questions, please contact me via Slack channel. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Marshall Johnson from Las Cumbres Observatory and I'd like to tell you about my work on the demographics of short period planets around A-type stars. These stars' protoplanetary disks are different than those around FGKM stars. They are more massive, shorter lived, and have different truncation radii. By studying their planetary populations, we can hope to disentangle the effects of these disk properties upon the planetary systems they form. Kepler measured the occurrence rate of short period planets around FGKM stars, but it observed too few A stars to enable such measurements. TESS's All Sky Survey has now observed a much larger sample of these stars. In my poster, I discuss my efforts to perform a uniform planet search for all TESS A stars, including careful handling of pulsations for delta scuti variables, and early work on injection recovery testing to measure the completeness. Come hear about my initial results on the planet occurrence rate for these stars and what it might imply. My name is Quan Tran and I'm a graduate student at UT Austin. I'm conducting a near-infrared precision radio velocity survey of young nearby stars to measure the giant planet frequency at intermediate ages. This survey is motivated by the population of gas giants found inside of their star's water ice line. Two migration mechanisms can explain this population of giant planets, which are unlikely to form in in situ, in spiraling disk migration, and three body dynamical interactions. These mechanisms operate on different time scales, so they can be distinguished by measuring the frequency of gas giants over time. We've been conducting the survey with the Habitable Zone Planet Finder, HPF, a near-infrared high-precision spectrograph at McDonough Observatory. 
So far, we've demonstrated sub two meter per second precision and have submitted our first paper on the survey's preliminary results where we confirm that stellar RV noise at near-infrared wavelengths is reduced compared to noise at optical wavelengths. If you're interested in my work, please check out my poster, be on the lookout for our first paper, and feel free to reach out to me. Thanks. Hi, my name is Cicero Liu, and I am a PhD student at Johns Hopkins University. We explore small planet occurrence as a function of metallicity for late-type dwarfs using the Kepler DR25 planet candidate list and its completeness products. We find that in the range of 2 to 5 Earth's radii planets, the occurrence scales linearly with metallicity. We confirm the theoretical expectation that the small planet occurrence and host star metallicity relation is stronger for low-mass stars than for solar-type stars. We established that the expected solar mass in planets around late-type dwarfs in the Kepler field is comparable to the total amount of planet-making solids in their protoplanetary disks. This high efficiency of planet formation favors planetesimal accretion over pebble accretion as the origin of Kepler small planets. Hi everyone, I'm Katrina MacDonald and I'm a PhD student from the University of Warwick in the UK. Alongside the debris disks and evaporating cold gas giant around a white dwarf we are going to hear about this week, there have also been observations of individual minor bodies in a state of disruption transiting white dwarfs. Each of these systems are different and pose questions about the way asteroid-sized bodies disrupt. My poster takes a look at how triaxial asteroids in a main belt analogue, which are perturbed onto extremely eccentric orbits, evolve. How many of these bodies tidally disrupt or sublimate completely before they reach the surface of the white dwarf? Does the shape of an asteroid affect its predicted disruption? How does the white dwarf's age and temperature affect the composition and extent of a resultant debris disk? If this seems interesting to you, then please take a look at my poster and I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Hello, I'm Tim Lichtenberg from the University of Oxford and I will present our ongoing work on the coupled evolution of magma ocean planets and their atmospheres. The bottom right shows one of the motivations of our studies. Um, young planets can lose a substantial amount of their primordial volatiles during the magma ocean phase, and these volatiles can fractionate relative to each other. So the physics and chemistry of magma ocean planets determines the composition and total mass budget of secondary atmospheres. We are interested in generalizing these calculations. Here in the middle, this teaser image shows how our model can resolve the magma ocean atmosphere evolution from the core mantle boundary to the top of the atmosphere for different volatiles and atmospheric compositions. And I will go into more details in the poster of how our models link the internal evolution with potential near future surveys of rocky exoplanets. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carolina Villarreal D'Angelo and I am a postdoc at the Observatory of Córdoba in Argentina. And I'm here presenting this work where we studied the stellar and planetary wind interaction in the GG426 system. And we aim to constrain the planetary and stellar wind parameters that are not observable directly by, by using uh, transit observation in some spectral lines. So we run six models by varying the stellar wind strength and the stellar EUV luminosity, which is the one that creates the planetary wind. And we then construct synthetic observation for all this model and compare our results with the observation in Lyman alpha and H alpha. So if you want to know more about our discussion, our conclusions about our work, I hope that you can go and check my poster, and if you have any questions, you can contact me by email or by the Slack channel. Thank you. Hi, my name is Atash. How do we detect exoplanets? Let us assume that my face is a star, and this is an exoplanet. When the exoplanet passes in front of me, some part of my face will be blocked off. So, if I was a star, my brightness would decrease. Let's see, we have our new exoplanet here. And this one, as you can see, has an atmosphere around it. So if this exoplanet passes in front of a star, 
the decrease in brightness would be slightly more. Stellar spots add noise to the data by changing the depth of the light curves. I used a machine learning model to reduce the noise to accurately measure the radius of the exoplanets in different wavelengths. I plotted the mean squared error of the model's prediction over these 40 iterations. In conclusion, my model was effective in removing the noise. My poster is entitled Color Magnitude Diagrams. I'm George Dransfield, a PhD student at the University of Birmingham under the supervision of Amory Triode. Exoplanet demographics is concerned with the classification of exoplanets. As the field is still in its infancy, classification is very much a work in progress. And while we're already quite good at putting planets into some categories, there are others where the boundaries are still a bit fuzzy. The goal of my research is to classify exoplanets using color magnitude diagrams. This would allow us to figure out what kind of planets we're dealing with and infer some bulk properties using just two measurements, infrared brightness and infrared color. It's a really exciting time to be looking at this, as in the next few years some shiny new telescopes are going to be launched and we'll be able to get these measurements for many more planets with better precision than ever before. So the future for color magnitude diagrams is looking pretty bright. To learn more, check out my poster. Hey everyone, my name is Simran and today I'll be speaking about the expectations from future missions in exoplanet demographics. I have made this line chart using three main indirect methods of detection. Here, transit method has shown the most remarkable number of discoveries, 870 in 2014 and 1505 in 2016. Out of all these discoveries, more than 2150 were discovered by Kepler missions. In the near future, Plato and Ariel missions will also be using the transit method which we have already seen is the most successful method yet. Plato will work on almost 1 million stars which will surely advance our understanding of exoplanet demographics because Kepler only worked on half a million stars and gives such astonishing results. Ariel will study the population of exoplanets, chemistry of atmospheres and formation of planetary systems all by transit method. Therefore, together they both will be a great breakthrough in the study of exoplanet demographics. Thank you. Was that the last one, Juliet? Yes, it was. And this was the remainder of the poster talks for the entire conference. So we will have no more poster talks this afternoon. Okay, thanks for the update. All right, everyone, thanks for hanging around for those awesome poster pops. Now you know the rules. Go over to the Slack and chat about them. Go find that poster that you saw that tweaked your interest and go chat about it. Uh, it's a break now for half an hour. Stand up, stretch down, touch toes, do that five times, get a glass of water. Head over to Wonder. We'll put the link in the chat uh, and say hi to people. And we'll see you back in half an hour for more talking about giant planets and brown dwarfs. Thanks, everyone.
Hi everybody, just for a note for those who are on and are confused, we're going to push back the start of this session just by five minutes. Uh, since we went a bit long in the last session, we want to make sure everybody has time for a good break. So in five minutes, we'll start the final session of today. Thanks everyone.
Hello, everyone. So I think it's 3.15 uh, now. So let's start the session. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to th session three of today's Exoplanets Demographics Meeting. Um, my name is Yi Fan Zhou. I'm a McDonald, McDonald postdoc fellow at UT Austin. My research interest includes characterizing planetary atmosphere, uh, planet formation, and direct imaging observations. I will be your session chair for this session. In this session, we are continuing our journey from giant planets to brown dwarfs with four exciting talks. They include one reviewed talk and the three contributed talks. These talks will be recorded. If you have questions, please type it using the Q&A feature. I will read your question at the end of the talk. Uh, answered questions will be pasted to the Slack channel for continuing discussions. Please stay engaged with us. Without further ado, let's welcome our first speaker of the session. Um, Darren Ragson from Brigham Young University will give us a review about towards underlying compositions and distribution of exoplanets. Darren, please take it away. Great, thank you. All right, let me just share my screen. Well, let's not start with the conclusions today. All right, so um, hello everybody. My name is Darren Ragazine. I'm going to be talking about the underlying composition distribution of exoplanets. I'm from Brigham Young University. Uh, many thanks to the conference organizers for helping, uh, for selecting me to give this review talk. Uh, many thanks to all of you. Um, I have to say one of my favorite parts of the field is going and reading your papers. So uh, so uh, really enjoy uh, understanding that and reading that. Uh, also, I have several collaborators who have assisted with, with various parts of this uh, presentation. Um, so I'd like to kind of start with an outline. Uh, I'm going to kind of begin um, with a sort of a look to where we're headed with uh, trying to understand the composition distribution. Uh, and then I'm going to um, talk about mass, radius, and composition and how those kind of intersect. Uh, and then I'm going to get into uh, what we need to do in order to get demographics of the compositions of planets, right? Um, and we're going to talk about how that will involve uh, using transits, um, but it will also involve some kind of mass measurement or estimate. Uh, we could have stability, we could have radio velocities, we could have transit timing variations. Uh, also include some transit timing variation demographics as I talk about that. And then I'm going to uh, propose that a really great method forward is photodynamical modeling. And so that you know, I have an agenda with this uh, talk. Uh, my, my goal is to convince you that uh, one of the best ways to move forward, an ideal way to move forward in this uh, field, is to, take, uh, is to have a model for the underlying composition distribution that is constrained by photodynamical modeling. Um, now, my um, abstract wasn't uh, maybe as clear as, as it could have been. I will be alluding to giant planets, but actually I will be talking a lot more about the systems for tightly spaced interplanets, a lot more about the small planets. Uh, many of the things I'm talking about are relevant for a variety of planets, um, but uh, definitely have a lot of references to super Earths, sub-Neptunes, and these kinds of things as we're looking at, uh, at these tightly spaced interplanets. Um, and these are uh, mostly from Kepler. Uh, as we know, this is, the, this, this is the example from Kepler. So we have here the, um, the planets with periods of 10 days, radii of a few Earth radii. And we want to understand what they're made out of, right? And so kind of beginning with the end in mind, like where were we going with, with this, this aspect of the field? I just want you to kind of imagine, like what, what would we do? What could we say about planet formation, about the evolution of planetary systems, if after we know we've removed all the observational selection effects and the biases, if we saw, for example, that these systems of tightly spaced inner planets were primarily composed of systems of three to five planets, that they were Earth-like rocky cores with a certain Earth masses, maybe the trend of, of the mass of the core got 
slightly bigger as you went to longer periods. If we knew that they had no ice, uh, but that they had hydrogen helium envelopes of one to two Earth masses. Uh, what if we knew that the super Earths uh, that didn't have any gas were best explained by differentiated bodies and that the compositions of the rock and the iron in those bodies were a match to the stellar silicon to iron ratios, for example? What if we knew that occasionally we had exceptions to this envelope fraction uh, where 20% of the time uh, there, was a, there was a system that, that looked different uh, and that those same systems were associated with uh, more excited uh, dynamical orbits. And so maybe hinting at some kind of giant impact phase of happening. Um, alluding back to kind of uh, Ruth Murray Clay's presentation uh, yesterday, uh, what if we knew that systems that had higher metals, like say it was star mass times metallicity. Maybe that was what was needed to make larger cores. Maybe this would tell us something about pellet accretion, right? So what you can see here is that we, we have a lot of things, you know, if we understood what the planet, what every planet that we saw, if we knew what it was made out of, right? We'd have a lot more information about how planet formation goes rather than just knowing what the radius is or the mass or some distribution of biased radii or masses, right? So if we really knew what every what the underlying compositional dis distribution was um, that would be that would be an amazing uh, step forward in planet formation and I think that is, is a goal that we share. So uh, here's an example um, of you know what if it was easy to understand this plot right you know so this is one of my favorite plots uh, from Liu Zhang's paper um, and you know uh, lots of things going on in this plot but uh, if as we study composition and formation and evolution uh, you know, features in this plot uh, will become more and more uh, easy and straightforward to understand. So let's kind of talk, uh, start out with uh, setting some ground rules for how some of this works uh, in terms of mass, radius, and density composition. And I want to start with buyer beware, caveat emptor. Most published mass radius relationships and composition inferences are based on observed data that has not accounted, uh, and these have not accounted for observational selection effects. Right, so uh, so you need to check. Um, I, I think I think it's fair to say that, that the most of the ones that are out there um, are based on what was observed, and we know that that's going to be biased, right? So TTV, and it will be biased differently for different types of planets. So Jason Steffen and Sean Mills and Sui Maza have looked and seen that the radial velocity masses and the TTV masses are different, uh, but that th this is very naturally explained by the different biases uh, in these systems because it's all based on observed data. Um, but just now, just in this most recent year or two, the field is now really moving to try to get to demographic mass radius relations. That is the underlying true actual mass radius relation, uh, not just the, based on the observed planets. Uh, and, 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 and there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, selection effects, not just is it, is it large enough to be detectable, but did we choose this planet or that planet to follow up? There's a lot of, of selection effects in the existing mass radius relationships. That, that doesn't mean they're useless, it just, it's just something really to, to remember. Um, another good thing to remember is that just having the mass of the radius alone isn't enough to infer the composition. There are still many degeneracies. Uh, my favorite way of illustrating this is to use a, a quaternary plot, it's called. Um, so this is a, a pyramid, and every point in the pyramid, the closer you are to one of the corners, the more of that component you have in your planet. Uh, so if you had an all gas planet, it'd be up here, an all rock planet, ice, metal, here in the middle would be one fourth of each of these components. Um, and so we know we have two pieces of information and at least four, uh, you know, well, three independent uh, things uh, uh, that we want to know about uh, a planet, uh, not to mention a huge variety of important uh, components in understanding the interiors of planets, everything from uh, the temperature or entropy to the age to whether the different phase, whether different elements go into different phases or different components. There's a whole, a whole nother uh, layer to this, but, but we know that there are degeneracies already. Uh, this is an example of uh, GJ436. This is images from Rogers Eager, but there are many images. Um, and um, this blue line here is sort of the, if then you took the nominal mass and radius and, and, and their interior models that they have, um, that would sort of be what you would infer uh, for the possible interior compositions. So you know that it's not mostly gas, right? You know that it's mostly uh, has some other things, but you can't quite tell how much metal versus rock versus ice or something. And this is not including cosmochemical constraints. And so we expect that we would be able to do better if you included things like that. 
Um, but uh, the other issue here is that this is, uh, this is a planet that had about 3% uncertainties in mass and radius. Typical uncertainties in mass and radius are at least 30% or sometimes 300%. <laughs> sometimes we have huge uncertainties. And of course, that just inflates this diagram. So this, uh, these different layers sort of that, that are being shown here um, are, are, are the addition of uncertainties uh, into this model. And if you, add, if you look at a typical planet with 30% uncertainty, then you could easily fill a huge portion of this diagram. Um, and that's so even if we measure the mass, we measure the radius, we kind of know what's going on, we still um, don't have an excellent idea of what the composition is. So there are some degeneracies to keep in mind. All right, with those sort of things um, behind us, what are some of the requirements for population level composition dem demographics? What are we going to need? Well, we're going to need large numbers of planets, right, to get good precision, and they're going to need to be mass and radius and density measurements. Uh, uh, and that's, that's going to be crucial, right? And so for that, if we need radii, we of course need transits. Um, and then to get masses or densities, we would need either stability or radial velocity or transit timing variations. And we'll talk about that more here. Um, personally, whenever you say transits and demographics in the same sentence, I immediately go to the Kepler prime mission, right? The largest number of, of planets. We have a deep understanding of the selection effects and all the issues there. Um, so, so that would be my recommendation. For this, pro for this problem. Um, the second thing that we need is we need a quantitative and detailed understanding of the selection effects, not just in the planet detection, but also in the characterization. Because in order to get a density, I'm typically doing more than just a single measurement. Maybe I'm combining, um, maybe I'm combining a mass from a transit and a radial velocity, sorry, a radius from a transit and radio and mass from radial velocity. Um, I have to understand the selection effects, why I chose to look at that planet. What, you know, what are the challenges in detecting the mass uh, and things like that. I have to kind of put all those together uh, into and, and have a detailed quantitative understanding of that. Otherwise, I won't be able to really truly infer the underlying properties of the system, right? So this is, this is a theme that we're going to see and have seen already over and over uh, in this conference. Uh, so let's take a look at, at some of these cases, right? So let's say I take Kepler and I add in one of these mass estimate techniques. For example, let's say I want to use dynamical stability. Um, there's actually a bunch of papers just in the last year uh, that really make this a lot more tractable, that show ways of, of estimating dynamical stability uh, in, in, that are very rapid. And those are great. Um, and here's an example from Dan Tamayo's paper, where just including stability constraints, um, they were able to take the mass of this planet and this orange histogram here is showing um, that just using stability, they were able to constrain that it couldn't be uh, one of these high mass planets. All right, great. Um, and that in t here they have TT this system also has TTVs, and you can see it's kind of similar actually, right? So that's that's nice. The problem with stability is that stability is kind of a squishy thing. It's not really very quantitatively de definable. Um, it also often depends on unknown parameters like the eccentricity, and it scales really badly with the mass, right? So uh, a small change in the mass. Uh, that leads to a very, very small change in, in any metric of stability. And so it's really hard to actually get precise masses this way. So generally, stability is nice to use in combination with other methods, but isn't going to be your main route forward to getting the underlying composition distribution. Um, an example of combining stability with, with other methods uh, is a paper for, uh, by Matthias He and Eric Ford and myself um, uh, that, that Matthias is going to be talking about uh, tomorrow. So, uh, and basically we use stability to help us constrain the eccentricities and inclinations uh, in these planetary systems and the Kepler multis. Um, so stability isn't really gonna do a lot. Radial velocity is a very off, obvious way forward, right? Um, and, and we want to do that. Um, it's kind of challenging to do this because you want large numbers of planets again. Um, and so, and again, you want quantitative selection effects. Uh, so to get large numbers of transiting planets, you naturally gravitate to Kepler, um, but Kepler planets aren't very good for radial velocities. And so you might say, well, then, okay, let's go ahead and do tests. But as Scott Gowdy said on Monday, TESS isn't really a demographics mission. Or we'll probably use it for that, um, but it will be challenging to, to do that. I think it's, it still could be interesting, but uh, we're not at the phase of understanding test demographics as well as we understand Kepler demographics. There's another real challenge with um, radial velocities uh, in that sort of this idea of completeness, whether you know how hard it is to detect a planet, whether you know if you've detected a certain mass and radio, a certain mass and period of a planet, uh, which is crucial for, for getting at the underlying demographics. It's actually very complicated in radial velocities in these steps. You have multiple planets, they all have similar radial velocity amplitudes that aren't that much higher than the uncertainties. They all have similar periods. Um, and, and we have a paper that's, uh, that's coming out 
where, and happy to share a copy if people are interested, where we show that really it's not, the planets in a system are not fully independent. You can't just treat it one planet at a time in terms of estimating completeness. And we think that probably many planets are likely missing from these systems, uh, which really makes this challenging. Uh, here's an example of, of, of a plot we have in our paper where we did a bunch of, ran a bunch of periodograms to see kind of what was going on. We have signal to noise on the bottom. And we had cases where there was base, where there was no observational noise, circular orbits, no stellar activity, nothing. Uh, and still you couldn't detect uh, uh, many of the planets in the system. Um, if you had more observations then that, that helped. So that was sort of the main thing. And so, so, so really challenging to say, you know, whether you've detected something with radio velocity. Um, the other thing that uh, Matthias is working on is understanding um, how, if you have a planet, what kinds of systems might be there based on what we know about the demographics of planetary systems. And you can see that there's all kinds of different radio velocity systems that might come out uh, of a planet. And if you only know of what, even if you know of one planet a priori, which is nice, because uh, say it's transiting, uh, there's still a lot of challenges in figuring out uh, how it is affected by other unknown planets. So radio velocities is kind of tough. Um, however, this is the best, one of the best, in my opinion, uh, so far, the underlying distribution, the underlying mass radius distribution done by uh, Andrew Niels and Leslie Rogers. Um, there's also uh, James Rogers um, uh, and, and Owen uh, who have a, a paper, kind of a similar paper. Uh, I think Andrew's gonna be giving a talk um, later at this conference. And um, uh, in, this, in this paper, um, they have a hierarchical Bayesian model, which basically means that they have a model for the population of planets, and then they apply those requirements for that model onto each individual system uh, and in order to kind of uh, do both the individual systems and the population statistics all at the same time. Um, they use the 35 radio velocities from, from, from Jeff Marcy's work on the Kepler mission. Um, uh, this is the, the mass radius diagram with their data here. Um, and they divide this up into three populations of, of gaseous planets, evaporated cores, and intrinsically rocky planets. Um, and this is the, their paper is, is more about uh, building the, the machinery for how to do this well. Um, but even with just a few radio velocities, um, they're already inferring interesting things about the composition distribution of planets, um, and even about the frequency of Earth radius planets. It turns out if you are thinking carefully about the different kinds of Earth radius planets, um, planets to infer a radius distribution out where planets should be rocky, you can actually get, uh, you can actually uh, affect your answer for eta Earth, for example. Um, and that's, that's really interesting thing. Um, so, so, so there has been some work on this underlying mass radius distribution uh, and, the, and the frequency of the different populations. That's really interesting coming out of their, uh, out of their work. And I'm sure more to come in the coming years from them and other groups. Um, I, I think uh, a great way forward is to use transit timing variations. Transit timing variations are planet-planet interactions causing subtle variations um, in when the planets transit, and it's dependent on the masses and eccentricities. Uh, a couple things to keep in mind as, we're ta as I'm talking to a, a larger group about TTVs. Um, TTVs analyses are, are known to be pretty accurate. Uh, so early on, we had some uh, unknown degeneracies and things like that, but, um, but, but we really have uh, made a lot of strides in this field. Uh, for example, there was for a while a, a apparent discrepancy between a radio velocity and a, and a TTV mass from Kepler-9. That's been completely resolved. Um, there is this eccentricity degeneracy, uh, which has to be studied. Um, there are ways of breaking this degeneracy if you have a large population that I can talk about uh, later if you want. Um, inclinations don't turn out to be very important, so that's nice. Um, inclinations can affect what we call transit duration variations. And I have a student, Kate Hendrickson, who has a poster on that, if you're interested in knowing more about that. Um, and I also have another student, Abigail Graham, and she's working on this question of what happens when there's TTVs that don't look like they're caused by any of the known planets. Um, and basically, um, even though there probably is some more testing that we need to do, um, it, we pretty much can assign a certain TTV signal to a particular planet uh, with a lot of confidence. And so unknown planets probably aren't really a, a serious issue, a serious systematic error in TTVs. So that's great. Uh, another concern that you might have about, that some people have about transit timing variations is that maybe the population of planets that shows TTVs is different from the overall population, right? So maybe they're a special subset. Um, and I don't think this is a serious issue. Uh, if you look at TTV measurements, this is from uh, Mackenzie Kane pa paper with, with me, my student. Um, this is um, period versus radius. And now the colors are showing, um, uh, the colors are showing the strength of the TTVs. Uh, one thing that's shown here is that uh, only the, 
Um, only some of these are, are well studied. There are hundreds of systems with weak or mild TTVs that haven't been studied very well. Uh, so that's, that's very interesting. But you can see they span pretty much this whole plane. They don't span everything, but it's pretty much consistent with selection effects. Uh, you know, it's easier to detect TTVs in planets that have larger ADI because they have larger signals, for example. Uh, another concern is that, oh, well, the TTVs are all this near resonant population, and maybe that's a separate population. But when you look at the period ratio distribution of all planets here, here in black, and then planets that show strong TTVs here in blue, there are enhancements near period ratios. There's actually quite a big enhancement here at the three to two. Um, but, but it's not like every TTV planet is coming from this small subpopulation. Uh, there's another issue with transit timing analyses, which is that these are missing the small planets, uh, because planets that are so small where a single transit doesn't have much signal, um, it doesn't typically have a meaningful transit timing variation. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. There's actually a huge strength that we have in combining transits with TTVs in order to understand compositions, uh, and that is that the planetary in, in the in TTVs, the effect of the planetary mass is almost entirely decoupled from the transit detection efficiency. Let me say that again. Because how easy it is to detect a planet in Kepler does not depend on the planet's mass, we can use information about the planet's mass, uh, we, we can take the information about the planet's mass and combine it with our existing understanding of how Kepler uh, detects planets, which is of course huge, right? There's a, there's a ton uh, of work on this in the field. Uh, so here's an example from, from our group, from Danley Tsu's paper of the, the frequency of different planets. And so if I have a planet with a radius of two to two and a half Earth radii, um, I know what its underlying occurrence rate is independent of its mass. And so if I take the mass measurements from this planet and, and the radius from this planet, and uh, I can combine these together to get an occurrence rate weighted mass radius diagram. Uh, this was uh, inspired by, uh, by, by Kevin Schoffman's uh, poster at Extreme Solar Systems, I, I realize this. And it means we can take all the machinery for understanding detection efficiency from Kepler um, and apply it almost instantly uh, to this mass radius diagram. So here's an example from, uh, uh, that, I, that I put together of, you know, this is still only based on detections. So this is not, this is not a true uh, analysis here, but if you take the detections and you weight um, how strongly the, you know, you weight the detections by, by their occurrence rate, um, then you can actually get uh, this occurrence rate weighted mass radius diagram. You can see there's still, it's still very sparse. We're still working on filling this in, but um, we can get information about the true underlying composition distribution uh, of these planets because now we have um, a, a, a detailed understanding of the selection effects, um, which only depend on the radius, and we combine that with a mass measurement from, from TTVs. Um, but there's actually something even better, uh, even better than that, and that is photodynamical modeling. Uh, so by photodynamical, I mean you take an n-body integrator and you connect it directly to the transit light curve. And with apologies to Becky Dawson, who uh, proposes a different terminology for this, I'm going to keep using photodynamical model for now. Um, and so one thing, for example, that happens is I mentioned before, you can't use TTVs on small planets. Uh, on the planets that don't have transits big enough to, to make a difference. And so, so this is a, a challenge that is not present in photodynamical modeling. You can do photodynamical modeling uh, on any size planet, on, on any planet, uh, without having to measure in tr uh, transit timings uh, in, in intermediate transit times. So for example, here is a case Kepler-444 done by Sean Mills and Dan Fabricke, my collaborators, um, at, where they measure the mass of, an, of a Mars mass planet. Um, that could not be studied with TTVs, but was not hard, to, but was you know doable uh, with photodynamical modeling. Uh, there are other issues that photodynamical modeling helps with as well. Um, and in addition, we can model all the planets, all the Kepler multis, um, with photodynamical models. Um, and this includes hundreds of planets that haven't even hardly been looked at that either have weak TTVs or upper limit uh, uh, upper limit TTVs or unknown TTVs because the planets were too small. So, so excited about this, we put together uh, something called the Photodynamical Multiplanet Model, or FODIME, uh, mostly written by Sean Mills and Dan Fabricke. I'm now taking over uh, the, the FODIME model uh, and working on that. It has been used already for over 10 papers uh, in various areas um, and is publicly available on GitHub. Probably a good idea to talk to me before you start using it. Um, but but we now have this photodynamical model um, that we are now uh, scaling up 
Um, and uh, here's an example of a photon applied to Kepler-18. We measure the density of the inner planet, which is interesting. That's the first time we've done that. We can even measure the mutual inclination between planets uh, and things like that, uh, that I'll let you read about in uh, some of my students' posters and things like that. Um, so, so, so what can we do? We take Jason Rowe's new catalog that he talked about yesterday. Uh, we get starting guesses from that. And, and then we are going to apply Fodine to all the Kepler multis, all 700-ish Kepler multis. Uh, and Daniel Jones, my student, has a poster uh, about doing this. And then we combine that with this hierarchical Bayesian modeling framework uh, from Neil and Rogers, which sort of has an empirical but physics-based sense of interior models and different composition distributions. Um, we can use the detection efficiencies uh, from SysM uh, from, from, our, from our group of, from our series of papers um, that again, apply almost entirely to the question of, uh, of, of radii. And so we can use pretty much all that information almost as is uh, and, and apply that and combine those detection efficiencies and measurements from masses from Fodine, uh, including all of the planets, not just the detections, but all the non-detections uh, and upper limits and things like that, uh, and combine all those together, I expect that we could increase by several fold uh, the information content in the underlying mass radius period distribution from where we're at today. Uh, so I'm really excited about, uh, about the, the prospects of moving forward, really understanding um, the, the underlying composition distribution. Uh, I'll just quickly go over my conclusions and then be happy to take questions. When we get to the underlying composition distribution, this will be a key step in understanding the formation and evolution of planetary systems. It's important to remember that existing mass radius relationships are typically not demographic. Uh, they, they haven't been corrected for these selection effects, but we're poised to make a lot of great progress uh, in, in this area. Um, when you uh, combine transit sensibility or radial velocity, there are some challenges, um, but if you combine it with TTVs, in particular with photodynamical uh, models, um, that uh, is a powerful way to get to great demographics modeling of the composition distribution, and this work is underway um, in, in our group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darren. It's an excellent talk. Um, so any questions, please type it to the using the Q&A feature uh, in Zoom. I'll give the audience a couple minutes. All right, we have our first question from Lauren Wise. Um, Darren, it's really cool to see your group uh, applying photodyne to all of the capital models. One concern uh, I have is that the photodyne only includes planets in your model but additional planets, especially non-transiting giant planets can also contribute to TTVs. Do you have a method to identify systems where photodyne does not fit a TTV well enough and where a giant planet might be present? All right, great, thank you. Uh, I want to actually start by thanking Lauren. Lauren's sort of one of our beta testers for Fodine and, uh, and has used it uh, and, and helped us out with it. So I appreciate that. And it's a great question, right? So one of the challenges with um, understanding planet-planet uh, interactions is that there might be missing planets. Um, so we actually have been making a lot of great progress on, on this problem, uh, on this question, and in particular for those systems which have known TTVs um, that can't be easily attributed to any of the uh, existing planets. So we went through the, say, the Holzer TTV catalog and looked and said, well, which ones of these can't, can, in Mackenzie Kane's paper, uh, which ones of these can be attributed to known planets and which ones we're not really sure. Um, and there's a list of about 40 of those. Uh, and I have a student, Abigail Graham, and she has a poster here at this conference where we went and looked and we tried the known planets and then we tried adding uh, an, an extra planet uh, to see. Uh, and in that case, we were able to really uh, clear this up and understand what happens. It's very rare. Uh, I actually can't think of a single example where say, uh, I, I thought I was measuring the mass of this planet, but actually the TTVs were actually some other planet that I didn't know about. Uh, and, that's, and that gave me a big systematic error. Um, so, so that actually doesn't happen. And that's because the nature of TTV signals is that, the, the, for example, the period is closely connected to the periods of the two planets uh, and things like that. So typically this, is, this isn't a problem. Um, but one additional, uh, but one uh, thing that, uh, we haven't thought about as much is if there's a small planet that didn't have TTVs, so it didn't make it onto this list, um, but it appears to not have a great fit. Um, I think basically what will happen is we'll be able to tell from the fits when uh, the existing planetary system just really isn't a very good 
is, is in a very good agreement. And there might be, I don't know, less, you know, one-ish percent of cases, probably less than 1% of cases where this will be, where we might miss something. Uh, but most of the time you can tell from the nature of the signal. Uh, we have one more question, but I don't think we have enough time. So we'll move it to the Slack channel. So okay, let's thank great. our speaker. And uh, we will move on to the next talk, uh, which is given by Fred Adams from University of Michigan uh, on the mass distribution of gas giant planets forming through the core accretion paradigm. Okay, does the sound work? Hello? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm gonna present um, the results today of a, an emerging method to start calculations of the planetary mass function. This is work done in collaboration with Michael Meyer and Arthur Adams at Michigan. So the arc of this narrative goes as follows. I'm gonna begin by assuming that the planetary mass function is of interest and that we would all like to know both observationally and theoretically how to determine that. Now, what I'm gonna talk about today is limited to the case of planets forming through the core accretion paradigm. And that limits us to planets in the range of about 10 times that of Jupiter down to about one tenth the mass of Jupiter. Now, I'm gonna assume that, or explore the idea that in the core accretion paradigm, we don't actually know what process ends accretion. Now there's about 200 of you out there. I know that some of you actually know what ends accretion, but even though many of you know that, you don't actually know the same answer as to what it is. So one possibility that people have put forward is that the way that accretion ends is simply that the um, disc runs out of gas. So the end of the disc leads to the end of accretion. Now here's the problem or the issue that we want to address. And that is that disc lifetimes are observed to be a distributed exponentially. And the planetary mass function to leading order is observed to have a power law distribution. So the first question we wanna address is, can an exponential disk lifetime distribution produce a power law mass distribution? And that leads to a higher order question or a more interesting question, namely, can we construct in general a framework that allows us to calculate the planetary mass function? And then if we understood that, there's understood that there's yet another um, question, namely, how does the um, planetary mass function depend on stellar mass? Now, since everybody has Zoom fatigue, the answers to these three questions are yes, yes, and it's complicated. So let's jump right into it. The disk lifetimes are usually assumed to have an exponential time distribution. What we actually see, as shown in this one example here, is that the disk occurrence as a function of star formation region age has nearly an exponential distribution. And we interpret that loss of, or the disk frequency as a proxy for the actual disk lifetime. Since you can't actually see the exponentialness on this plot, I've replotted it here with exponential distributions of various half-lifes. It turns out that a half-life of about 3 million years, the red curves on these two plots seem to work about um, best. Remember that a 3 million year lifetime, or 3 million year half-life corresponds to a exponential decay time of about 5 million years. So let's assume that we know the disk lifetime distribution. We will also assume that we know the planetary mass function that we're um, trying to explain. Um, there are various compilations of this. We would of course like much more data. The bottom line is that it's about a power law with an index of about 1.3. And that will be our target distribution for comparison, but one can change that. So I'm gonna work within the core accretion paradigm, which we will now briefly um, summarize. The core accretion paradigm is generally broken up into three phases. The first phase is the formation of a core. In rough terms, rocks get together and form a 10 earth mass core, and they have to form a 10 earth mass core before there's enough gravity in the core to accrete gas. That ends phase one and starts phase two, where that solid core can start to accrete gas. Now during phase two, there's not that much gas, which means that the gas is puffy, it takes a while for it to cool, and it has to cool for the core to accrete for the gas. So this phase is slow. After the core and the gas have accreted enough mass so that there's about equal amounts of gas and core, or gas and rock, then the cooling rate can speed up 
and the accretion rate can speed up, phase two ends and we enter into this runaway gas accretion phase, which is called phase three. Some folks like to plot it this way where you see the rock, the gas, and the total mass as a function of time. And there's various times for these phases depending on which model you're using. So what we wanna do um, is we wanna consider the case where we have a planet forming in a disk. The background disk forms or provides some conditions, namely a background rate of um, accretion through the disk and a lifetime. But once we get into the vicinity of the planet, there are other factors. Um, the hill sphere defines the, hill of, the sphere of influence of the forming planet. And there's an efficiency with which the um, material gets from the disk into the hill sphere. And then not all the material that gets into the hill sphere actually makes it onto the planet. So there's another efficiency with which the forming planet can actually hoover up the material that's coming in through the hill sphere. So this is just sort of a, a schematic diagram of what we're doing. In equations, we're doing something very simple. The final mass of a forming planet is equal to the mass at the end of phase two, plus the integral of the mass accretion rate over all time, where the time ends when the disk ends. Now here's the thing, we can redefine the time to be the time from the end of phase two to some other time, which is the um, adjusted disk lifetime. Now, one simplification that you've got is that because the disk lifetime has an exponential time distribution, the offset time also has an exponential time distribution. This is just a property of radioactive decay-like models. If you have a bunch of nuclei, you can come back some later time, and whatever sample you have left will continue to decay with an exponential with the same half-life. So the point is that we don't actually need to know how long T2 is. We know that we'll still have an exponential decay time or an exponential distribution of decay times for this um, later phase. Now, the other ingredients we're going to put in is we're going to assume that the mass accretion rate goes like some power to the hill radius. Um, the standard case is to take the power to be four. You get two powers of radius from the cross section and another two from the fact that the material shocks. And to remind you, the hill radius goes like the planetary mass to the one third power. Then in addition, we will um, introduce a random efficiency factor. So you put all those pieces together and the mass accretion rate onto your, onto your planet has an efficiency factor, which is a random variable, a base accretion rate, and it will vary with the mass of the planet according to some power. So what you could then do is you can calculate the mass as a function of the random variables in your problem. You can either sample these variables and construct a PMF. And for this simple case, you can actually write it analytically in terms of an exponential integral. Either way, you get an answer. The answer you get, um, depends on a mass scale. Remember, we have to specify the overall mass accretion rate, not the full accretion rate, but the accretion rate coefficient that goes in the previous thing. If I turn that into a mass scale by multiplying by the um, time scale of the disk exponential um, distribution, I can turn that into a mass scale. And that will be convenient. And what you get is you get a planetary mass function as a function of this mass scale. And here's the answer for that simple case I showed you. If I make that mass scale one, 3.16 and 10 Jupiter masses, I get the green, the red and the blue curves here. And what you see is that it's very parallel like. In fact, with the larger mass scale, you get something that works pretty well. The black line is the target observational power law, which is um, power law with a slope of 1.3. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna assume that that works and we're gonna go on to the next um, piece of um, the calculation. Given that the IMF sort of works, and I should remark before we go on that we can build more complicated models. That's the sort of the simplest model that will actually give us a reasonable result. Um, but given that that works, we can then ask the higher order question Namely, how does the PMF depend on stellar mass? Well, we have a couple of observational um, findings. We know that the disk lifetime seems to decrease with stellar mass. We know that the disk mass is roughly proportional to the stellar mass, at least in the beginning, 
from linear um, stability considerations and from observational constraints. We know that the stellar luminosity increases with stellar mass. And that means that the radius of the ice line increases with stellar mass. So at the ice line, the core accumulation time also increases. And you put all these pieces together. And what you find is that in um, qualitative terms, disk around low mass stars have trouble forming planets because they don't have enough mass. And disk around higher mass stars will have trouble making planets because they run out of time. So if you integrate the amount of mass you can accumulate over the time that you have to accumulate it using the observed scaling laws that the disk lifetime goes like one over the mass of the star and the accumulation time goes like the square root of the mass, you get the um, mass supply as a function of stellar mass. I should say that little m in this um, plot is the stellar mass in solar units. So one solar mass is here. You see that for little tiny stars, you don't have much mass. Then you have sort of a linear phase. And once you get to too high of um, mass stars, there's not enough time to um, accrete much um, material anymore. So here's where I'm going to make a big leap. I'm going to assume that this function here, which is a observed compilation of how much mass is available to make planets. I'm going to assume that this reflects the value of the m naught scale that shows up in my planetary mass function theory. And what that will give me is it will give me a collection of mass functions as a function of stellar mass. And this is the result. And what you see is that the red curve is for 0.25 solar mass stars. The yellow curve is for half a solar mass stars. And then the other curves, which all sort of all merge together are for one, one and a half and two solar mass stars. And what you find is that if you buy into this picture, then the low mass stars will have a steeper um, planetary mass function. And that means um, in rough terms that they have trouble making large planets. In other words, there'll be a deficit of high mass planets formed through the core accretion paradigm for the lowest mass stars. If you go all the way up to the very highest mass stars, then you also will have a deficit of planets overall because there's not, not time to make any, although that is not reflected on this plot. Now, since I'm out of time, let me just go to the conclusions. The conclusions suggest the following. We have in fact constructed a framework for making um, models of the um, planetary mass function. The three main ingredients that I think you need are you need an exponential lifetime distribution, an m dot that increases with planetary mass, and you need additional random efficiency factors. And with these three minimal ingredients, you can take an exponential time distribution for the disk lifetimes and produce a power law planetary mass function. When we first started this, my original um, goal was to show that these two things would be incompatible and that we would have to have some additional mechanism to end the accretion. But what you find is that if you have these ingredients, then you can in fact make a power law planetary mass distribution with an exponential disk lifetime distribution. Now, furthermore, within the context of this framework, you can use observed scaling laws to define the mass supply as a function of stellar mass. And then what you find is that you get a planetary mass function as a function of stellar mass. And the main result there is that for low mass stars, the mass supply limits you and you have a deficit of higher mass planets forming around low mass stars through the core accretion paradigm. So this is probably a good place to stop. I think I'm out of time. Um, let's take some questions. All right, thank you very much, Brett. Um, so the first question is, how does this compare with the mass ratio function uh, found in microlensing Suzuki et al. works? Ah, um, not too bad. Um, one thing that we didn't have a time to talk about was that what the microlensing observations find is they find actually not a planetary mass function, but a mass ratio function. So instead of taking the distribution of planetary mass m, it's actually the um, distribution of the ratio of m to m star. Um, if you go back a few things, you can see that this was the original planetary mass function as a function of mass. And this is what you get as a function of um, mass ratio. For these particular cases, it's not too different. Um, for different ranges of parameter spaces, one of the things you can find is that the distribution of mass ratios is a little bit more 
robust or universal than the distribution of planetary mass masses themselves. Um, also, I'm not exactly sure what the preferred power loss slope is for the current microlensing um, observations, but I believe they're at least in rough agreement with what we're finding here. This would be useful for, it'd be useful to follow this in further discussion. Um, do we have time for another question? Um, I don't think so. Let's uh, move on to the next talk. So- Okay, well, thank you. Thank um, you very much, Fred. Um, so our next speaker will be Svon Ginsberg from UC Berkeley. Uh, he'll talk about heavy metal Jupiters by major mergers. Thanks. Uh, give me a second. Okay, can everyone see the slides? Okay, great. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, uh, heavy metal Jupiters by uh, Major Melvins, which I've been working on with uh, Eugene Chang. And thanks for choosing this title for the uh, science fiction stories. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, although the actual one dealing uh, with heavy metal Jupiters were kind of this topic, uh, but uh, yeah. Um, so this project is inspired by this, uh, by this very nice paper by Daniel Thorgan et al, who presented it uh, uh, earlier. Uh, so what they did was to estimate the uh, metallicities of gas giants. Uh, so the metallicity Z is defined as the uh, fraction, the mass fraction of uh, heavy elements, metals, anything heavier than hydrogen or helium out of the total mass uh, of the planet. Uh, and the way to estimate the metallicity, so Daniel explained this in more detail, but to zeroth order, you estimate the metallicity from the mean density of the planet. So if you can measure both the planet's uh, mass and the planet's uh, radius, then you can calculate its mean density. And from the mean density, you can essentially estimate the metallicity Z uh, of the composition. Uh, so here are the results. Um, and you can see that while some plan, oh, and also from the metallicity, you can see that you can easily infer uh, the mass of, of total metals, which really fills the mass of the rocky core, the metal core inside each gas giant. So you can see that while some planets are consistent with having uh, these standard uh, rocky cores about 10 times the mass of the Earth, other planets, the ones over here, which we call the heavy metal Jupiters, uh, uh, can only be explained with very heavy metal cores, having about 100 times uh, the mass of the Earth in metals. Uh, and such heavy metal cores are difficult to reconcile with uh, kind of standard vanilla coal accretion theory. Uh, so in coal accretion, we think that these metal cores grow in mass. And as we've just seen from third stop, when they reach some uh, critical value, uh, around 10 times the mass of the Earth, then they quickly explode. They uh, accrete the gas in a runaway fashion from the protoplanetary disk, and they quickly uh, grow into gas giants, into Jupiters. Uh, so how can you explain metal cores much heavier than this uh, critical mass? Uh, so one way to explain this is by planetary mergers. Um, so if you have uh, two planets, each with its own metal core, then when the planets merge, so do the cores. So this is how you can build up a more massive uh, metal core. Uh, so this idea has been suggested several times in the past, and, and Ruth actually mentioned it during the first talk uh, of the conference. So what I'm going to do in this talk is to kind of quantify this idea and especially uh, its implications on the mass uh, metallicity relation. Uh, and I'm going to analyze these mergers using this, uh, this toy model uh, for a planetary system. So I'm going to assume that we have a planetary system with equal mass planets M uh, separated by equal distances uh, delta A. Uh, and how often mergers happen uh, in such a system uh, is typically parameterized by this parameter k. Uh, so k measures the, uh, the distance between planets, delta A, measure the units of the hill radius of each planet. So this is how delta A and M uh, come into play here. Uh, and, this, uh, and this k essentially measures the stability of the planetary system. So uh, if, for example, delta A is very large, the planets are very far separated from one another, 
Um, then they can't gravitationally perturb one another, so you have less mergers. So K is larger, the system is more stable. Uh, if the planets are very massive, then they can easily perturb one another gravitationally. Uh, K is smaller, the system is less stable, you will have more mergers. Uh, and actually this power of one third uh, can and should be collected uh, using more sophisticated theories and you get a more precise value for this power, but it's always pretty close to this one third. Uh, so we'll stick to it for this talk. Um, so how can these planets go? They can go in one of two ways. Uh, they can either merge with one another uh, or they can simply create the gas from the protoplanet protoplanetary disk in a standard uh, gas accretion. So let's analyze these two modes of growth. Uh, so mergers, as I mentioned, uh, depend critically on this parameter K. Uh, so the time to merge is some, usually parameterized as some power law of K, K to some power law uh, alpha. Uh, well, as a gas accretion does not depend on the distance between planets, right? Because each planet accretes its own gas so the gas accretion time scale depends only on the uh, only on the mass of the planet, uh, and as we've just heard from uh, Fred, these planets are in the runaway growth regime. So you can see that the more massive the planets are, uh, the faster they accrete gas. And now let's go back to mergers. So mergers stabilize the system, right? Because each merger doubles the mass of the planet, but it also doubles the distance between planets. So if you go back to K over here. Uh, if you double both delta A and both the mass, you can see that the overall effect is to uh, increase K. So this stabilizes the system, a larger K. So mergers stabilize the system. Gas equation, on the other hand, does not change the distance between planets. It only changes the mass. So it destabilizes the system. It decreases K. Uh, so because mergers stabilize the system and gas equation destabilizes the system, uh, the conclusion is that the system is driven towards this equal time scale evolution where the time to merge on average follows the gas equation time scale. And we can easily solve this equation, right? We can take T merge from over here, substitute this K, uh, take T gas from over here, and you can immediately see that this gives you a power law. This explains how delta A, the distance between planets, grows uh, as the mass of the planet uh, increases you get this power law. And now by substituting reasonable values for beta and alpha, uh, you get the delta A scales more or less as M to the one fifth. Uh, so what does it measure? So essentially delta A measures how many mergers we had in the system because mergers are the only way to change the separation uh, in this model. And because mergers are also the only way to increase the mass of the core, the mass of the core also scales as M to the one fifth. So M is the total mass of the planet and M core is the mass of its rocky or metal core. So the conclusion from all this analytical exercise is that uh, heavier planets with larger total mass M also harbor heavier uh, cores simply because they merged uh, more times. So now let's go back to the mass metallicity relation, uh, M, uh, Z versus M. So these dotted magenta lines uh, are the lines of a constant core mass. But as we've seen, the core mass is not constant. More massive planets, how do more massive cores? Uh, and specifically, they follow this solid black uh, line. So we see that you start from a 10 m Earth uh, core over here, but by the time the planet has grown to become a few times the mass of Jupiter, its core is closer to 30 times the mass of the Earth, meaning that the planet has undergone, on average, one or two mergers. Uh, and this solid black line actually fits the average, the mean of the, of the observations better than these steeple uh, uh, dotted magenta lines. Uh, but still you can see that this line can't explain all the scatter that we observe over here. And specifically it can't explain these heavy metal Jupiters that we see over here. So what we think happens is that these perturbations which lead to mergers are in essence uh, chaotic. Uh, and they can happen on different uh, timescales, which were recently quantified by these two papers. Um, so although the average gas giant, given by this solid black line, although the average gas giant merges only once or twice, other planets can be more lucky. They can merge more times. You can have a series of mergers. You can have a merger tree. And these merger trees grow chaotically. So even if you start with the same initial conditions, you can end up with very different final outcomes. And this is what we try to quantify uh, with these dot dashed black lines. 
So these lines measure the scandal just from this chaotic behavior. So starting from essentially identical initial conditions, this chaotic scandal can explain, you can see most uh, of the observed planets, most of them, but not all of them. If you want to explain the most extreme uh, heavy metal Jupiters, you can't do this by starting from a 10 m Earth core. You can't build your way up from 10 to 100 with mergers. That's too many mergers. Uh, you have to start with, an initial, with a relatively uh, heavy initial core to begin with. So what we show here is that if you start with a, a 30 m Earth core, you can build your way up to 100 with mergers. But for these mergers to actually happen, uh, planets must be excited into eccentric orbits so that the orbits can cross and the planets can collide, as you can see in the diagram. But remember that we are talking about mergers during runaway gas accretion. Uh, so these planets are still embedded in a gas disk from which they accrete all their mass. And these gas disks, as you know, try to circleize the orbit. They damp these eccentricities on a time scale which depends on sigma gas, uh, the density, uh, the density uh, of the gas disk. So these gas disks have to be uh, depleted. Sigma gas has to be low enough uh, for these mergers to actually happen. So now you must, must be asking yourself the question, wait a minute, if sigma gas has to be low, if the disk has to be depleted, will I actually have enough gas left to build my Jupiter? And the answer is yes. By comparing this damping time scale to the other time scales in the problem, you find that this is the level to which the gas disk has to be depleted. And you can see that the amount of mass left, sigma gas A squared, uh, is just enough, just enough to be the Jupiter, about 10 to the minus three, the mass of the sun, as long as this process happens at 10 AU or beyond from the star. So this scenario is consistent as long as it's done at 10 AU or beyond from the star, and later on planets can migrate in Um Okay, so uh, is there any observational evidence for this, uh, for this scenario? So one thing you can do is go and look for uh, evidence for this uh, violent uh, perturbation in merger history. You can go and look for these eccentric orbits. So here we have a plot from Fogel et al. showing the residual of the fit for the core mass. So essentially the mass of the core compared to the average to the mean core mass as a function of the eccentricity. So you can see that while circular planets can have all kinds of cores, eccentric planets uh, over here tend to have uh, massive cores. Uh, so this correlation between eccentricity and core mass might be a smoking gun uh, for this merger scenario. Another thing you can uh, go and look for is maybe spins. These collisions might spin planets closer to the breakup rotations. So I summarize the talk. Um, so I try to demonstrate how mergers during runaway gas accretion uh, can explain the formation of these heavy metal Jupiters. And specifically, I demonstrated these mergers naturally explain the mass metallicity, Z versus M relation. It can explain both the overall trend and more importantly, the uh, chaotic behavior of these uh, mergers naturally explains the large scatter uh, that we see uh, in the observations. And for more details, I encourage you to take a look uh, at our paper and I'll end up here and take any questions. Thank you. Excellent, Svan. So we have one question already. Um, great talk. Do you think Jupiter mergers may result from stellar flybys or depend, dependent on the presence of stellar companions? Do you know if there are any observational evidence for this? Oh, so good question. I actually never thought about this. So here uh, we assumed that all the mergers happen kind of uh, uh, in-house, you kind of, uh, uh, the planets perturb one another. Uh, we didn't take into account any stellar flybys, uh, but that's a good question. If you have a stellar flyby uh, or just another stellar companion, then yes, I think you might have more mergers, uh, but I'll have to actually calculate this to see what's the effect. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I have a question. So you mentioned about using the spinning to test the like the merger histories, but most of the hard Jupiters they are tightly locked. Do we have like enough time scales to find like the spinning um, like abnormality? Yeah, yeah, great question. So so when you look at the so when you look at this Thorgan sample, so uh, about half of the planets are interior to 0.1 AU, which is exactly what we would expect. Uh, 
uh, tie the locking to, uh, uh, to, lock, to lock the planets. And about half of the sample is further out. So yeah, so for about half of the sample, there's no spins. The spins would be anyway locked, but there's half of the sample is left uh, well, you won't be tidally locked, so you might look for uh, for spin anomalies. Yeah, great question. All right, thank you very much. So thank let's uh, move on to our next talk, uh, which is given by Theron Carmichael from Harvard University. So we will have, a, following Carmichael, we'll have, uh, he led us to exploring the transition between giant planets and brown dwarfs with Tess and Gaia. Take it away. All right, great. Just want to verify we see the screen. Cool. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Theron Carmichael. I'm a uh, six-year graduate student at Harvard University. Uh, and I'm working on my thesis research with uh, my advisor, Dave Latham, on transiting brown dwarfs. And so for this talk, I want to give everyone sort of just an overview of some of the basic questions that are motivating that research, and then uh, get into a discussion on uh, how, how and why I'm using transiting brown dwarfs specifically uh, to better understand their evolution and hopefully one day their formation mechanisms uh, through the uh, substellar mass uh, radius diagram. So... I like to start off these talks by thinking about these three different populations of objects that we have here, uh, giant planets, brown dwarfs, and the very smallest, slowest mass stars. And uh, basically the questions that, you know, we've talked about a lot so far this conference, if I will continue to do so, is, you know, the question of how do they form? And in the context of my thesis research and like the work we'll be doing is asking that question uh, in terms of how do these form as companions to stars and specifically transiting or in the case of the small stars eclipsing objects, right? And so we've talked about a little bit about this session in particular, but we generally understand that uh, at least for giant planets that they form via some version of core accretion or uh, co the core accretion uh, mechanism. And then on the other, other side for the very small stars, uh, they form via some uh, version of, you know, the collapse or fragmentation of uh, a, a gas cloud, right? So, uh, but that question is not as clearly understood for brown dwarfs. And uh, so the way I'm approaching this is sort of kind of from the middle here and specifically uh, with uh, leaning towards getting a better sense of how brown dwarfs and giant planets might be connected. Um, so, in order to do that, uh, we're looking for transiting brown dwarfs specifically because it is those objects that we can measure both a mass and a radius from. Uh, it's not the only way to do that, but this is the sort of the approach that we have uh, chosen to take. And in that case, then uh, we can look at some of those those two physical properties for these different populations of objects to get a sense of you know what we're what, how, um, just sort of like what we're working with here. So in the case of the physical size, the radius, uh, these three different objects, these different uh, different populations of objects tend to be about the same size with, you know, the brown dwarves getting as small as maybe say the size of Saturn, right? Um, but then they are distinct uh, by their masses. And this is, you know, by definition. And I want to just take a moment to focus on, you know, that the uh, distinction between that we sort of arbitrarily draw between um, giant planets and brown dwarves. And I say arbitrarily because this is, you know, the, the known, the, the uh, threshold for deuterium to be fused in the core of the brown dwarf. And to be fair, that's an analogous process maybe to the uh, uh, hydrogen fusion that separates stars from brown dwarfs, yes, but that essentially relegates brown dwarfs to these things that uh, can, can fuse deuterium but cannot fuse hydrogen. And that's sort of how we you know, decided to separate them from you know, their similarly sized you know, uh, uh, planetary and stellar counterparts. So my work then is to look forward to detect and try to characterize more of these through the transits of their host stars. However, this is not as easy uh, as we would like it to be. Uh, and you can kind of see that in this plot in, uh, with regard to how relatively few uh, uh, brown dwarfs we have, uh, we know of uh, uh, compared to giant planets and low-mass stars. So that's to say that this plot is showing a representative sample of transiting giant planets, eclipsing low-mass stars, and the complete sample of uh, transiting brown dwarfs. And you know, this is again emphasizing and highlighting the brown dwarf desert, right? So what's interesting though, I wanna uh, point out is this mass distribution on the right-hand side here. And if you would to say rotate that, 
distribution and, and mass of these few populations I'll sort of rotate that on its side and overlay that with this sort of image I had up before the sort of idea right and this is not a new idea this is not my certainly not my idea this has been you know uh, talked about a lot in, uh, in the past but uh, the idea is that maybe this mass distribution reflects the uh, for the distribution of formation mechanisms for these different types of, of, of um, for these different types of objects, and then maybe that helps us to rethink or encourages us to rethink, you know, uh, where we draw that line between, uh, in particular, in between uh, uh, giant planets and brown dwarfs. Uh, but as I said, brown dwarfs are pretty rare, and I'm you know, taking this sort of from the middle approach, the middle of these two populations. Uh, we need to find more of them. So most of my work has focused on the detection and characterization of transiting brown dwarfs to measure their masses and radii. And in particular, in terms of understanding their you know, evolution and everything, we also would like to get a good sense of their ages. And that comes from the host star. And I'll kind of get into that in this uh, next part of the talk here. Um, but just to briefly go over how we're doing this specifically, uh, I want to just take a, a couple of slides to talk about the observational techniques we're using here. So. Those are, it's essentially what we're doing is a combination of transit photometry and Doppler spectroscopy. So first, let's start with the transits, right? Uh, we're using the test mission to look for, search for candidate transit brown dwarves. Uh, candidate because uh, we're getting a estimate of their radius and we're looking for things, like I said, between roughly one to two times the size of Jupiter. And we are later following that up to verify the mass. But the important thing about the transits and in particular, uh, the sort of volume of light curves that we're getting from tests is that we have a uh, radius estimate and the orbital inclination, which is important in the next step in uh, uh, measuring the mass. So that comes in the form of taking uh, uh, radial velocity observations or using Doppler spectroscopy to um, uh, measure the, you know, the, 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 the uh, uh, movement of the host star. And uh, we can then take that uh, minimum mass that we're getting from the rate of velocities, right? Combining that with the orbital inclination and then getting a, a mass in addition to that radius that we got. So this is the technique we're using. Uh, this is of course, you know, uh, bias. And we've talked a lot about observational biases so far as selection effects, right? Uh, this is uh, most uh, useful in shorter period, uh, 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 for shorter period brown dwarves. Um, that said, uh, this is how we're getting these uh, masses in radii for these uh, transiting brown dwarves, right? And from there, now we can say, okay, let's take a look at, um, now that we have a way to find more of these, let's see what we can actually use these mass radius measurements for. In particular, using them to uh, test and benchmark substellar evolutionary models. So uh, let's take the last part of this uh, talk to just uh, get a little bit into what mass radius models look like in the sort of substellar uh, mass range, right? So this is the, uh, uh, here I'm just showing one set of models from, from 2003. There are other ones that can also be applied here, but just to keep things simple, we chose this one. Uh, you know, they change things like the composition of the uh, atmospheric composition of the brown dwarf, uh, the environment, and other things like that. Uh, you know, but essentially, this is the sort of uh, sort of trend you might see, and that's to say that uh, at younger ages, uh, you will find brown dwarfs to be at larger radii, and they uh, decrease in radius as time goes on. So, in other words, what that translates to is that they cool off over time. And this is important because you see how much the radius of the brown dwarf can actually change over its lifetime. So it's important that when we, when I, in the next slide show the brown dwarf population, it's important that we pay attention to the brown dwarfs that have particularly precise radii. Um, so uh, with that said, this is the brown dwarf, transient brown dwarf population as of, you know, essentially mid, mid 2020, right? Um, and again, I want to emphasize the importance of getting precise, uh, in addition, precise mass, mass measurements, but also precise radius measurements. You see several brown dwarfs on this diagram have, you know, uh, uh, radius uncertainties that span the entire vertical space of the diagram. And that's not to say those are useless, uh, but really those are just sort of uh, saved for just uh, sort of counting or the, the sort of census of the brown dwarf population. The ones that we really want to pay attention to, though, are the ones that have precise radius measurements and also relatively precise age estimates for their host stars. Examples I'm showing here in the blue uh, is a star that we've uh, used uh, gyrochronology to try to constrain the age of its host star. Um, and the other points in the yellow are highlighting examples of brown dwarfs with host stars that are in uh, stellar clusters. Uh, would, the game here is essentially to say we have uh, 
higher reliance or the, the um, uh, stellar models in terms of finding the age are more reliable than these, you know, substellar models that we're essentially trying to benchmark, right? And so we're trying to use those to get a better understanding of how these models for the brown dwarfs uh, uh, behave and like how well they're predicting the, the data that we see. So in th this case, we found that in terms of this star that we've used stratigraphic chronology uh, to get the age of is relatively consistent with the substellar models of the same age. Same goes for this particular point that is in a, uh, a 600 billion year old star cluster. But that story isn't always, you know, we don't always get a nice sort of agreement with any one particular set of substellar models. Um, I'll, I'll save sort of that discussion. Or I'll refer people to the paper I, I'm, I'm showing here that maybe dives into that discussion a little bit more. But suffice it to say that uh, there are a set of substellar models that do reproduce this particular brown dwarf, but not the ones I'm showing here. Um, but essentially, though, this is what we're trying to do. We're looking to increase this population of, of objects right now with the test mission primarily uh, to get a better understanding of how this evolution works and really build it up with the ultimate goal of trying to connect it back down to uh, the uh, planetary population. So uh, last couple of things here, basically, uh, I do want to emphasize that. So yeah, like I said, we have about 26 total transiting ground doors. And what's really promising is that in the past two years uh, with the test mission, we've discovered about or at least eight new ones. There are other ones that I'm not I haven't plotted up on here. So it's really promising in terms of, especially when you note the number of new brown dwarves in the blue points with uh, precisely measured radii. So that's really promising in building up this understanding of, or building up the population of transient brown dwarves first, and then looking to some of these really like, I think really like fascinating ideas that we've talked about uh, in previous talks in this session about how you might form something at this mass. And and really how that formation mechanism from planets to brown dwarfs to stars sort of changes as a function of mass. So um, I'll leave it my summary uh, here and just emphasize uh, one last point that um, uh, we don't really know how all brown dwarfs form. We know that some of them must form like planets, some of them form, must form like stars. And we wanna understand that formation mechanism as it changes as a function of mass. Uh, one approach to doing that is to study transiting brown dwarves because we necessarily are able to measure their masses, radii, and in some cases, their ages. So that's really helpful for benchmarking these substellar evolutionary models and hopefully connecting those to the uh, planetary and, and uh, low mass star models uh, in the end. So thanks, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Darren, excellent work. Uh, we have a question about the brown dwarf desert. So yesterday there was a talk, I think mentioned that we are not so sure about the existence of brown dwarf desert, but your uh, graph demonstrated uh, the existence of the desert quite nicely. Any comment on this and how certain are we about this? Uh, so yeah, I apologize for not catching all the talks yesterday, but so yeah, I will say uh, just going back to uh, that talk. So in terms of the existence of the brown dwarf desert, um, I think really the question is like, yeah, it exists, but it's more of how narrow or wide or narrow is that range of masses? Because we're talking about a, a mass range, right? And it's a, a deficit of objects. And I, I'm really sort of fond of the idea, though again, we really need a lot more like sort of observational evidence for this. I'm fond of the idea of that this brown dwarf desert, this mass distribution really is reflecting the distribution of formation mechanisms responsible here. Um, Again, it's 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 a hard hard idea to really like get a lot into quantitatively, aside from looking at mass distributions, because we I think we need more brown dwarfs. So in that sense, yeah, it's, it's sort of implicitly acknowledging that there is a lack of brown dwarfs, specifically in in uh, in in, in uh, as as companions to stars. So uh, yeah. Um, so one last question. Are isolated brown dwarf fundamentally different from brown dwarf form in disk around other stars? I honestly, I maybe leaned one way or the other on that question, but like after hearing some more talks, especially this session, I am much more open to different interpretations of how so fundamentally different in terms of formation mechanism, which I think is a good way to sort of uh, give a baseline as what is what in terms of distinguishing planets from stars or from brown dwarfs. Um, yeah, I would say, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of waffling back and forth on that because uh, other, in terms of whether they're fundamentally different or not, um, because on the one hand, uh, 
the presence of the disc must, you know, have some sort of uh, uh, influence and in terms of like, you know, whether it forms like a planet or not. But um, I think the really way to get to answer that question, which is hard, is getting a better sense of getting how to get the masses of those uh, sort of field brown doors um, uh, or, or, or widely separated brown doors even, which would be a much better point of comparison, I think. So, um, but yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's something I want to think about some more. Yeah. All right, I think that concludes this session. So Jesse, 